the who's it on the what's it. Attach the what's it to the who's it. Connect the thingamajig to the thingamabob. And that'll make the whatchamacallit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Making Records with Eric Valentine. Uh, I am not in beautiful Topanga right now. I am in the equally beautiful and wonderful Vermont. You can uh, see behind me. It's a, uh, it's a winter, winter wonderland out there. Uh, yeah, you can kind of see the snow coming down. It's snowing and look, looks amazing. It's beautiful here. Um, so, man, we're, we're doing it. <laughs> we're doing T-Ride, Zombies from Hell. Uh, so I don't know um, how many people out there actually know what that is. Um, you know, there's definitely been some people commenting about it, asking about it. It's finally happening. So for those of you that do know about it, you're welcome for doing it. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't, I'm going to give a little bit of the background on this because this goes way back. We're going, we're going deep. Um, I joined this band when I was 16 years old. Um, and it was, it was an interesting circumstance, you know, uh, I started playing drums when I was really young, and, uh, um, I had a drum teacher, this amazing guy named Terry Carlton, um, was just a incredible drummer, incredible musician, and a, a really incredible, um, influence for me. I just, um, adored him. He, he taught me a lot about how to be a good human being, um, in addition to teaching me how to play drums, and so... Um, he was just part of the Palo Alto music scene, or the sort of Northern California Bay Area music scene. And um, uh, I was taking lessons from him. There was a band that hired him to play this really crazy drum part. And um, it had been programmed into a drum machine, and they needed somebody that could actually play this part. And so they enlisted him to do that. They, they showed him a recording of the, you know, the programmed drum machine thing. And he, he learned it and played it for them in a recording. Um, and so that happened at one point. So that's how he knew the folks that were a part of this whole thing. And then later on, they, uh, I guess, had a falling out with their original drummer and um, needed somebody to join the band that could play this part. And um, when my drum teacher learned the part, he showed it to me and I learned how to play the part. And, um, you know, when I was 15 or 16 years old, and so when they said, hey, we need a drummer that can play this part, my drum teacher said, I, I got a student. He, he's a guy that can play this part, um, so you should check him out. So I went and auditioned for the band and uh, showed them that I could play that part and other things as well. And they were getting ready to do a recording. And so I joined the band specifically to do a recording. And at the time, um, the band was managed by this guy. Uh, and man, I... I, for, I forget the guy's name now, unfortunately, but uh, he also managed um, a somewhat well-known guitarist from the late 60s, early 70s, this guy named Ronnie Montrose. Uh, he had a band called Montrose um, that Sammy Hagar sang in um, and uh, for their first album, and they did some amazing stuff. They did this song called Rock Candy and Rock the Nation and uh, a bunch of cool songs in that first, first album. It was sort of... Sammy Hagar's kind of, you know, introduction to the world, um, as far as I know. And, uh, and so Ronnie Montrose was going to produce the band um, uh, to record some demos and try and get a record deal, and they needed a drummer to play in the recordings, and so I joined the band to, to do those recordings. Um, I was a junior in high school um, when this was sort of gearing up, and... Um, and so it was a real problem, actually, because the recordings were happening right as the school year, school year was starting. And, um, and so I had to get my teachers to agree to give me time off to go and do this recording because it was going to happen over, you know, a course of a week um, out in Richmond, which was, you know, far enough from Palo Alto that I couldn't uh, just drive there every day. And, um, and so that happened. I ended up joining the band. Um, ultimately, those demos didn't really come out the way everybody hoped they would. We thought it was going to sound like the Montrose record, and it, and it didn't. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we were kind of frustrated with that. It, didn't, it ended up not manifesting in a record deal. And at the same time, you know, leading up to this, I was always interested in recording. I got into recording stuff when I was very young. So I started playing drums when I was about five, and, and early on when I was probably maybe about 
11 or 12 is when I really started getting interested in recording. I was using just, you know, home cassette decks and Radio Shack mixers and stuff, line mixers to make recordings at home. And, uh, you know, eventually graduated to a little Tascam 4-track uh, Porta Studio, this 244 thing. Um, and so by the time I joined uh, T-Ride, I was already doing lots of uh, recording, you know, on my stuff. I was recording friends bands, I was recording my own music, um, all kinds of stuff. And so um, after the kind of unsatisfying experience of spending kind of a lot of money, at, at, you know, at the time, that these sessions with uh, Ronnie Montrose, if I remember right, they cost $5,000. Um, that was just everything the band had saved up, um, and they just ended up kind of unsatisfying. And so... Um, we decided we should just, you know, we could have taken that $5,000 and built our own studio. <laughs> you know, we could buy enough equipment if we with five grand, we could have made our own demos and we'd still have a studio, you know? And so that's what we ended up doing, um, you know, in a somewhat unscrupulous way. We, uh, at the time there wasn't, you know, the internet to sort of like quickly check everything. And so what happened was um, the, the singer in the band, Dan Arley, he applied for a bunch of credit cards all at the same time. Um, he sent in the applications at the same time, got approved for a bunch of credit cards. We used those credit cards to buy a small collection of recording gear um, and built a studio in his parents' garage. And that was, that was the beginning of the T-Ride or, you know, um, little garage studio. And, and so then I went into business, you know, um, doing a studio. And so that started this process of like, we, we opened the studio and we had an ad in a local magazine. It was called BAM Magazine, Bay Area Music Magazine, um, where we advertised where people could come and, you know, and pay an hourly rate to record. I think the, the initial hourly rate was $12 an hour <laughs> to come and record in the studio. We had a Tascam M520 mixer and um, a Fostex B16 half-inch 16-track. Um, I mean really no usable microphones to speak of. We had microphones, but they were all just dreadful and um, a very limited collection of equipment. But, you know, it was, you could put somebody in a room and, and hit record and you would record stuff. Um, so I started doing that and it was great for me to just kind of learn about recording in general. And then we'd always set aside a couple days a week to work on T-Ride music. And at the time the band was called Telluride. Um, with one L, so the same name as uh, the, um, the beautiful ski resort town, but uh, uh, minus one L. And, uh, and so, you know, that was the beginning of a long run of just working on and developing the music uh, for the band T-Ride, and it took a long time, a ton of experimentation. So that went on for a couple of years um, like that, trying to get things better, you know, you know, trying to pay off credit cards, um, trying to get enough money so we could improve the equipment. We were always on the hunt of like, what is the secret answer going to be, you know, that's going to make our records sound like Led Zeppelin meets Def Leppard, you know, like what's, what's the piece of magic piece of gear that's going to make that happen. And so we just continued that journey for a couple of years. And then um, we, we moved to another location. Actually, this was, yeah, a couple of locations. There was a, there was a lot of locations for the studio. So this was now, our third location is when we finally crossed paths with another record producer engineer, a guy named Wally Buck. Um, he brought in another band to our studio to record, and then we played him some of our stuff, and he was immediately like, I've never heard anything like this. Um, I'm interested in this. I want to get involved. And so he had a production company, and uh, he signed the band to the production company, and then he brought the band to Bill Graham Management. The band got signed um, by Bill Graham. And then Bill Graham uh, connected us with uh, um, a really wonderful lawyer, a guy named Jeffrey Light, who I still work with today. He still represents me today. So we've been working together for, yeah, uh, a little over, you know, 30 years, maybe 30 years and a little bit of change. Um, and, uh, and, and all of those people, Bill Graham and everybody, they ended up getting us um, signed to a record deal. And we took... Everything that we had learned about the demo um, recordings that were done with um, Ronnie Montrose and applied it to how we approached the record deal. And so we had interest from a number of, of record companies. Most of them were not insane enough to agree to do what we wanted, which was give us the entire album budget. Um, we will buy 
um, uh, an improved collection of equipment for our studio and we'll make the record ourselves. And so most of them said, you're crazy. <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing that, um, except for one, which was Hollywood Records. And so we said, all right, Hollywood Records, you get, you get, the, <laughs> you get to sign t Ryan. And, uh, and so we did exactly that. We took the majority of the budget and bought this amazing Neve console, an 8038 Neve console, like 32 1081s in it, a whole 24 channel monitor section. We bought a Studer 800. Um, it's still the same Studer 800 that I have um, in the studio now at Barefoot. Uh, we bought a Ampex MM1216 track. I have that same tape machine still working in my studio today. Um, and then like a, U a U47 tube mic and a pair of C12As, all of those mics I still have, um, still use, they're incredible. Um, and so we, you know, we upgraded our studio gear and set out to make a record. We actually built a studio in a warehouse. That was not quite as successful. That, that was my first lesson in, um, uh, you know, just doing things, uh, you know, in a way that looked good on paper doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sound good. There was a bunch of really weird stuff that happened um, that made it so the sound room didn't sound good, the, the control room didn't sound, it was a very difficult place to work, but that's, we were stuck, you know, we, we had to work there, we had invested the money in it, and so that's what I used to f finish off the record. Um, it ended up ha having everything take forever, it took for a long time to build this studio, get all the gear installed, get everything working, sort of figure out how to use it properly and, and really start getting stuff out of it. But um, that, uh, that finally happened. And uh, I'm trying to think if I'm really missing anything along the way here that's important. Um, this story is it's so long and so vast. I'm, I'm trying to not waste too much time on it because um, it just goes on endlessly. Uh, but um, so we did eventually finish the record there. And... Um, then uh, it was time to mix the record, and this is one of my first like mix shootout things where, um, oh, actually, there's one. Okay, there's there's one other thing that was kind of important. So they wanted us to meet with uh, record producers. They really wanted to have a record producer involved, and we had no intention of doing that um, because uh, we were just you know young and cocky and arrogant, and I thought I had all the answers to everything and. And the only part of our sort of opinion on things that was, that was probably justified was that there was really nothing like what the band was doing. And there was no producer that was going to walk into this and go, oh, cool, yeah, I know what to do with this. It was just way too weird. And there was only one guy that totally recognized that. Um, and what we did, so when they said, we want you to meet with producers, we basically had zero, zero intention of actually working with a producer. We just gave them a list of people we wanted to meet. <laughs> and so I, we basically listed everybody that worked with Led Zeppelin and Queen and, uh, and just see who would take the time to come meet with us. And so uh, we got to meet with Eddie Kramer and this guy named Mac who made some of the later Led Zeppelin stuff, like the Presence album. We met with Roy Thomas Baker and Tony Visconti and probably some others that I'm forgetting now, but um, an amazing collection of like some of the most brilliant record makers on the planet. And it was super fun. They were all incredible to meet and talk to and hang out with and, you know, just, you know, experience. They're just a, a, extraordinary people. Um, and like I said, there was only one guy that really kind of recognized the reality of the situation. That was Tony Visconti. Um, anybody that's not familiar with him, he recorded like the T-Rex records and a bunch of David Bowie and amazing stuff, a brilliant, brilliant record maker. And so he showed up and we played him the demos and as soon as we stopped the demos, he, he just flat out right out of the gate just said, I have no idea how any of this is being done, so I'm not here, I, I, don't, I don't think I can help you at all, but let's go get some dinner and hang out. This, you're totally interesting to me. And so <laughs> that's what we ended up doing. We just went and got dinner and heard incredible stories about David Bowie. Um, and he was super, super cool, super cool guy. Um, but yeah, that was a great experience. Uh, so then we're, it was time to mix the record. The record company, again, they wanted somebody to mix the record. Um, and so... Uh, I really wanted to mix the record myself. We had very specific opinions about um, how the record should be voiced and mixed and what, how, how things should be featured. And so 
So we had to go through the thing of, of having somebody else, you know, try and mix the record. And so we hired somebody uh, who was a very, very successful mixer at the time. I think he's probably still doing stuff, but, you know, done huge, huge records for, you know, like Aerosmith and all kinds of stuff. And, um, and it was a great mixer. But again, like this project was so bizarre that I don't think anybody could really just step in and go, sure, yeah, this is how you do this, you know. Um, and so he worked out of Canada. And so we, uh, I flew out there with the master tapes and the Atari computer that was used for the programming and my samplers and stuff. Because everything, it, the whole project was basically two two-inch reels that synced together and an Atari computer that synced via SMPTE to the analog masters in order to get everything playing back that you needed while mixing. And so, um, so I had to be there just to help set everything up. And now, wow, it's really, it's really snowing now. Look at that. That's beautiful. Um, and, uh, and so, and now, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get into this later, but, um, looking back on it now, I, I just like, I, there's no way anybody could have made any sense of this project if without me being there. So I was there to just get everything, you know, to show up on the console and just make sure that he's using all the right parts and everything was, you know, syncing together properly and all and load the samples and everything. So I was there to do that. He mixed a few songs. Um, you know, for us, it ended up not like our vision. They, they weren't bad mixes. They were exciting sounding mixing, mixes. They were just a little bit harsh for what we were looking to do. And so, you know, I told everybody, I want to have my swing at mixing this record and, you know, put me in a great mixing studio and, you know, give me a shot at it. And so they said, all right, you get your chance. And so I picked Studio A at Ocean Way. <laughs> they had this massive, like, 64-channel Focusrite console in there that had been modified by Alan Sides and blah, blah, blah. It was the place that ultimately uh, Jack Joseph Quigg moved into. And he was working at Oceanway around this same time. He came in while I was mixing in there. There's some, some really funny exchanges with him. Um, really cool guy, but he, you know, he, he at the time he was just super into outboard gear and I was using one of these Dolby, Dolby A um, noise reduction units um, as a high frequency enhancer, a high frequency exciter. It's a cool thing you can do. You pull out a couple cards and you run vocals through it and it makes the vocals sound super bright and airy but not in a harsh way and uh he walked in and saw that unit with the cards pulled out he's like who told you about that <laughs> it, was, it was really funny um and so uh so i went and mixed uh at this place and um and ultimately when i finished my round of mixing and everybody heard everything they agreed that um my my mixes were you know captured the vision of the band better and uh and so they approved me mixing the record um, so I was probably, I don't know, 20 years old at this time, and, um, and so ended up mixing the whole album at Ocean Way. I think uh, I got a picture of me here. Uh, okay, well, there's that. <laughs> that's that's um, a 16-year-old me um, just after I joined the band. So uh, I th I'm sure you can guess now this is uh, the world of hair metal. And so having, uh, you know, a lot of hair volume was important uh, for getting into this genre of music. And then, so here's me later on. It's kind of a fuzzy picture, but this is this massive Focusrite console at uh, Oceanway um, Studio A. And there I am with my T-Ride tattoo, um, working on mixing the record there. Um, and so, um, and so yeah, uh, so the, the record got mixed. Um, ultimately, it got mastered by Bob Ludwig. Um, we chose him because he had just mastered so many records that sounded amazing. Um, my personal experience with him was not super awesome. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I know lots of people that have had really incredible experiences with him, and obviously he does great work, but man, that guy did not care about me or my record that I'd worked on for four years. Like, really super, just didn't seem like he cared at all. And it was, it was kind of a bummer for me. Um, but uh, ultimately, it's, you know, the mastering came out fine and uh, the, the, the record came out. Um, so then uh, the record came out. We had to go and tour. Um, uh, touring was challenging because there was only three guys in the band. And when you hear this music... Um, and that is an ambitious prospect for three dudes on stage, man. There's a lot going on there and, you know, um, very ambitious. And so it was hard, hard to pull this stuff off live. 
And so we toured for a little over a year. We toured in Europe a little bit, um, toured in the States. We ended up opening up for Joe Satriani, um, the guitar player that was touring with the band. Uh, Jeff Tyson was a student of Joe's, and Joe was also managed by uh, Bill Graham Management, so it was a lot of uh, connections there. And, um, and so, yeah, we toured for a while, and then, um, you know, I think... Uh, there was a lot, there were very high expectations for this project. People were really thinking that this was going to be like the next big thing. And nobody really anticipated that right when our album was coming out was when Nirvana was going to happen. <laughs> and so that pretty much totally ruined it. <laughs> it. It was the death knell for, you know, the style of music that we had sort of tried to you know, deliver the most highly evolved version of, and uh, and so that was it, man. It, it just crushed that record and everything, you know, that we were trying to do. Um, I, I, I remember seeing the Teen Spirit video and just going like, uh-oh. <laughs> but, you know, we were, there was no turning around, so we, we went out and gave it our best shot. And um, uh, we made a couple uh, music videos. We made two two music videos, and it was really funny how, how they, they did it. Um, uh, so they got the flavor of the moment video director, a guy named Sam Baer. He had just made Nirvana's Teen Spirit video. Um, and so his formula was just a performance video with the band, have some dancers in there, and you're great. And so uh, Hollywood Records kind of struck a deal with him, and so he did two videos basically at the same time, um, just right one after the other. And so he did uh, a video for the song we're going to dig in today, Zombies from Hell, and he did a video for this other song called Back to Romeo. And they're basically exactly the same video. Um, he just change the costumes for the dancers in, in one of the other, you know. So zom Zombies from Hell, predictably, the dancers are dressed up like zombies, and Back to a Romeo, ah, actually, Back to a Romeo, there was a little bit of a narrative. There was some acting going on in that one, so uh, it was a little bit different. But, um, yeah, essentially kind of the same thing. And so um, this is probably a good time for everybody that has no idea what I'm talking about to just get a little taste of what... T-Ride was and is, I suppose. Um, so this is the music video that was made by Sam Bayer for the band back in 1991, 92, something like that, um, for the song Zombies from Hell. Check it out.
to put in up be your best fight to you good when the matter whether or not to you try with the all of your might you don't know what you think you're out of your league your best just to come around to see the enemies once we go look at the Okay, so, <laughs> so there you go. Um, yeah, that, that, there I am in there, shirtless, playing drums. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, uh, you can, you can kind of get the idea for anybody that hasn't heard of this thing before. Um, it, was like, it was an interesting combination of influences. Um, obviously, the super high acrobatic singing. And, um, and the big harmonies, like that was all influenced by Queen and Def Leppard. Um, there is, it's, it's hard to hear in there, but there's definitely, you know, like a Led Zeppelin influence um, just without the blues um, in there. And, um, and this also almost kind of industrial influence to the music, which was, um, I think, came, stemmed really from the fact that, like, you know, I ended up programming a lot of the drums, um, we had this hybrid, and we'll we'll get into all this once we see the session. That um, at the time, I, d I just didn't have the engineering skills to be able to get the sounds like as explosive and powerful as I wanted them. Just sitting down on a drum kit and playing, I you know we just I didn't know how to make it happen. And so, in order to get it to come out of the speakers the way we wanted, I could we could only do it with samples. And so we would end up programming the kick drum and the snare drum, and there was a bunch of samples that got sort of layered together. It was sort of my go-to collection at the time. And then I would overdub cymbals and toms on top of that because um, I've mentioned this before in some of the um, question stuff, question and answer stuff, that you know, um, the programmed cymbals and toms sounded really stupid to me, and so I would play those, and it was easier for me to get those sounds to happen as long as the kick drum and snare drum were like these just powerful like packages of explosive drum sound, you know, um, and so, uh, and so that was sort of the combination of influences. It was like this, you know, high sort of Robert Plant singing with, um, you know, guitar that was influenced by like Eddie Van Halen and sort of the acrobatic guitar playing stuff that was going on in the 80s and big harmony vocals from Queen and sort of the more programming thing from like Nine Inch Nails, like all sort of merged together in one thing, and it was really quite unique at the time. There, was, there really was nothing like it um, at all. Um, so there you go. I, um, I, that, that pretty well kind of gets you up to speed on what this thing is. So let's, let's dive into this crazy song, and you can see how, you know, the 20 or, I mean, a lot of this was really done when I was still a teenager, the, the teenage brain of... Uh, Eric Valentine <laughs> worked at trying to put together what we thought was going to be the ultimate piece of music of all time. Um, okay, so here we are in the Pro Tools session. So one of the things is that this intro bit, um, I actually tried um, splitting out the tracks and mixing that at Ocean Way, and I couldn't beat the original demo mix of that album intro. And that album intro was the only thing that I really, that I specifically wrote. Most everything else, all the chords and stuff were written, chords, vocal melodies, lyrics were written by Dan, um, and I would help figure out sort of how to play guitar parts and drum parts and stuff like that, but um, really like... <clears throat> you know, the essence of what the songs were was really written by Dan. But the album intro was the only thing that I did where I actually sat down on a keyboard and played those chords and 
um, figure that whole thing out. And that was done a long time before the album came out. It was done probably sometime around 87 or 88, and mostly on this Insonic ESQ-1 keyboard um, and uh, a sampler um, sampling these, uh, these tom sounds from a Scritty Politty 12-inch uh, <laughs> remix. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff in there. Um, and so I tried um, putting it on a 24-track master and mixing it at Oceanway, and I couldn't beat the original mix that was done on this little uh, Tascam M520 mixer and the Fostex B16 half-inch 16 track. Um, and so that mix was just totally unbeatable. Um, here, I think I have, yeah, so here's, there's the little <laughs> Tascam M520 mixer and, uh, and the Fostex um, B16, 16 track, there it is. And so the mix that I did, um, with those elements uh, ended up being the best thing. And so we just kept that. I had, I had it recorded on like a DAT machine. And so that ended up, I just played it onto the half inch master and cut it onto the beginning of the record. So that was the mix that we ended up um, using. And so um, we have, uh, you know, here it is here. This is just the stereo mix that I had done you know, in the late 80s on a Tascam mixer. And so I don't, I can't really deconstruct this for, for you all to check out. Um, here it is. And actually, um, the other thing I'm going to do now, because I don't really have any speakers here in Vermont, I'm putting on headphones. And I'm going to try to really not yell at you guys while I'm listening to stuff. So I'm going to really try and not screw that up. Okay. Uh, but I want to hear this too. That's those those scritty politty toms. Bunch of Ebo guitars. Okay, so that was the intro, and that's that's as much detail as I can give you on that. Um, but yeah, it was just a bunch of program stuff, some synths and uh, Ebo guitars, like I mentioned, drum samples, uh, big, huge cymbal swell um, on that big transition there. Um, but, uh, you know, and then Dan did this, like, um, dialogue thing that's supposed to sound like this, you know, um, uh, some sort of, like, historical account of some, you know, past dramatic event. And uh, there was some stuff in there that, just we really wanted to make completely unintelligible and so I reversed some of the words to make sure you couldn't hear exactly what he was saying because it was just kind of absurd I think he says in the year like 5000 BC or something <laughs> something like that but um, it just we just wanted the sound of a of a dramatic voice in there you know um, okay and so then I'm yelling aren't I I think I am yelling oh my god the headphones it's happening Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and not yell. Okay, I'm gonna reactivate all these tracks and hope that my computer is gonna just be able to handle this. We get into where the actual song comes in, and there's this, you know, crazy acrobatic guitar lick that happens. Um, I should talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so there was, I, it was cool when I when I transferred all this stuff. Um, I discovered there were still two versions of it that were in there, um, both. Uh, Jeff Tyson, who I mentioned, he was the, the fellow that ended up touring with the band. Um, he played a version of it, and this other guy named Steve Wamet also played a version of it. Um, and so we ended up going with Steve's version. Both, both of them are very cool. Steve's was just a little bit more of this like super machine gun fire accuracy that just made it that much more kind of insane sounding. Um, but yeah, I can, I can actually play both versions. Nobody's ever heard Jeff Tyson's version of it. Um, Jeff ended up having to try and play it every night, um, <laughs> you know, when we were uh, trying to do it live. So he, he got quite good at it um, when we were touring. Um, but here's that, that opening lick. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, it's just a, a bunch of those like uh, brushing kind of kind of moves, you know, brushing across the strings to play these chords. And uh, you know, a lot of how these uh, T Ride songs were created was um, Dan had this uh, this little um, Casio uh, PT20 or a PT30 keyboard that had these programmable chords in them, and he would just program in the chords in sequence, and then it had this little trigger that would advance through the different chords. And, uh, and so he had these really complex chord progressions that were sort of the foundation of these songs. And so that's what that guitar lick is doing. It's arpeggiating through the chord changes that Dan had programmed in on this uh, Casio keyboard. Um, and so then the idea was that I, on the drums, would, would play with it. Okay, so you can hear me play this this drum lick at the beginning, and this is me actually playing the, the, the whole drum kit. This was something that was not really going to work um, programming. And so I, I actually do play the snare and the kick um, because it's just moving way too fast for me to try and actually leave those out. Um, and then the snare and the kick get doubled with the samples in, in this opening lick. And then after that, I'm only playing cymbals and toms. So, so here's the opening drum lick. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's just a bunch of fast single stroke rolls and double kick drum stuff in there. And, uh, and you know, it's phrased to try and match the phrasing and the chord changes that, uh, that the guitar is arpeggiating. Um, and so it was kind of interesting, uh, you know, a couple things that we can, uh, uh, you know, hit on as we get into this. So first, um, basically resurrecting this session, um, in order to get it so it's presentable was not easy. Um, and so I went back to these tapes that are now almost 30 years old and put them on my tape machines. Well, before I put them on my tape machines, I baked them. Um, and uh, for anybody that's not familiar with, uh, you know, analog stuff and tape baking and stuff, that's a thing that you do. What happens is that when the, when the analog masters, when these reels sit for a very long time, they absorb moisture from the air into the adhesive that is basically gluing the ferrous oxide onto the plastic backing. Um, there's this like ferrous, ferrous powder, you know, powdered metal that um, has the magnetic properties that make the tape work. That gets glued to the plastic backing on the tape and they use an adhesive to do that. And so the adhesive was is absorbing moisture from the air over decades of time. And so when you try and play the, the tape, it gets real sticky and, the, um, and the, the, the oxide starts just wiping off the tape onto the heads of the tape machine and it'll destroy the master if, uh, if you're not careful. And so, um, so I baked these tapes. It's actually really easy to do. Um, in this round, I bought a, uh, a dehydrator on uh, Amazon for about, I don't know, 120 bucks. I can fit five two-inch reels on the racks inside this uh, dehydrator. You set it at 130 degrees and the dehydrator does exactly what you'd expect, but you know, it heats up this you know, uh, enclosure and it has a fan running. So any uh, moisture that is released because of the heat um, gets pulled out of the enclosure. So it's really good at drying stuff out. And, uh, and so Two two inch masters, uh, twenty four track masters. You you want to leave them in there for a good ten to twelve hours. So on uh, these masters, I left them in there for twelve hours. So you really have to kind of like plan things out, and then once you do that, um, you you know you bake them. You get all the moisture out of there. Um, everything hardens up. You can put them on the tape machines. You know, and it, they perform great, just like the first day you bought them. Um, I don't, I, you know, I didn't have any shedding issues and stuff like that. The, the, the problem is, is that they go back to having the moisture in them very, very quickly, which is something that I, I didn't know um, before this round. And so you have about a week to two weeks um, to, to transfer everything off those reels. And so a couple of these I ended up having to bake twice because there's all kinds of other complications, just getting, making sure the machines are playing back perfectly because like, this is my only chance to actually really archive this stuff properly and have it preserved forever, um, hopefully, um, because 
I, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to keep my tape machines working. They're pretty grumpy at this point. It takes a lot of effort to really make sure that they're going to be reliable and work right and be cool and not have a power supply blow up or something go wrong with them. Um, so it took a lot of effort to make this happen. The other thing that was really tricky was, um, in order because these are on multiple master tapes, um, these master tapes will synchronize together with a synchronizer. I use an Adam Smith uh, Zeta 3 synchronizer. I know that's, that's something nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> it's not a very popular synchronizer to begin with, and so um, I'm probably one of the only people that use, used it and uh, still use it. I have, I have probably three or four of them now because they kept dying. The company doesn't you know, exist anymore, and so I had spare parts, or I could try and keep them working, and on and on and on. Um, they the one that, the ones that I have out of the three, I barely got one to work in order to do this these transfers. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's really tricky. And then getting Pro Tools to chase the time code that was a whole drama as well, trying to get that to work. And so I went back to Barefoot. Um, it wasn't until the fourth time I went back that I was like, okay, I've I've got totally perfect transfers, you know, nice 96K, 24-bit transfers of these analog masters where everything is in sync and it's all happening the way it's supposed to. It, it, it was not easy to do. So I got that. Uh, the other thing was that, um, like I mentioned, the kick and snare drum are, were sampled and programmed with an Atari computer, an Atari 1040 ST computer. I forgot to look up a picture of that, um, maybe. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put up a picture of that right now. Mm, ha ha ha, check that out, Atari computer. Um, and I used a very, very early incarnation of what ultimately became Logic Audio. There was this company called eMagic, and they had this software called SimptiTrack. It was the only MIDI sequencing software, uh, well, yeah, maybe there were some others, but the only one I knew of that would sync to Simpty timecode. And so, what ended up happening is the two um, two-inch masters would sync to each other with a, Z a Zeta synchronizer, and then the um, the Atari computer would also be fed that time code off of one of the two masters, and uh, it would chase the analog masters and play back the samples. So we used um, an Akai S1000 sampler um, to do all the drum sampling. I don't have that sampler anymore. I don't have the discs. Um, it used these little three and a half inch floppy disks um, to store the patches and stuff. I don't have any of that. So I rebuilt all of those samples. Um, I used battery and I remember basically what the samples were. Um, some of them I did save. The custom samples that I made myself of drum hits um, in our room and stuff, I still had those archived. Um, and so I was able to bring those back and then the stuff that was sampled from other people's records, I, I remembered what those were and put it all back together so I could, you know, do this reconstruction of, uh, of this song. So let's look at a little bit of that. Um, so these are the kick drums right here and these three are really, uh, are actually really just these two and there, there's some other stuff in there. I don't remember what it was and so I just kind of did stuff that I use now. Um, are the kick drums uh, that were, you know, a version of the kick drums that were sampled. It's not absolutely identical, but it's definitely very close to what it was. And so the main component is this thing, which is um, a sample from the Power Station song, Some Like It Hot. Um, it's an amazing drum recording. I've referred to this before, and uh, it's this incredible engineer, this guy named Jason Cassaro, who's passed away, but Man, he was just a crazy, you know, innovative engineer mixer guy and got some unbelievable drum sounds. Tony Thompson playing drums um, with just incredible processing. So, uh, so this is that kick drum. And then there's a little bit of the kick drum from When the Levee Breaks. Gotta love that. So that's those twos together. And then in the original thing, there was something that was just kind of punchier and drier and more solid, and I don't remember what it was. And so um, I used a, a version of that that I use more now. This is a sample that I've shown before. Uh, it was on the um, 
uh, All American Rejects Gives You Hell song. Um, you, you, I probably uh, showcased it there. Um, so that's this kick sample. And you can hear all those together. And this guy, Loop 62, adds a lot of just solid punch. So there it is with it. There it is without it. And then the other thing that I did um, that I just didn't, I, I don't know, I just didn't really tune into back then, I added a new kick drum part, basically an extra emphasis on the downbeat of, you know, every, every half bar. Um, because uh, it just felt like the whole thing wasn't quite anchored enough. And so I added that. And it's, that's one of the things that's been really interesting about pulling this back up is, um, you know, I just kind of went through uh, and got the samples together and put everything together and did things kind of more the way I approach them now. And it was very interesting to experience, like, uh, my vision for what this music should sound like is the same now as it was then. I just think um, I have so much more uh, experience and much better tools available to execute it now than I did then. And it was really interesting going through this process of trying to realize that same vision with an additional 30 years of experience and vastly more powerful tools to, to work with um, and see where, it, where I ended up. And even just like, you know, this is me kind of throwing together a mix on my laptop <laughs> with headphones. That's the, the only way I, I'm, I can do it right now. So I don't get to use, you know, my like distressors and unfair childs and whatever stuff. Um, and my, you know, outboard summing mixer and, you know, this is all on the laptop. And still, I think this sounds um, much closer to what my vision was um, than what I was able to achieve when I was 20. And so that, that part of this was very interesting to me. It's, you know, I, maybe this is like um, uh, in its own totally obscure and completely unknown way, because nobody really knows about this band, um, like when you know, George Lucas is reworking the original Star Wars movie with a bunch of stupid you know, digital CGI stuff you know, instead of using actual puppets and you know, whatever dressed, dressed up elephants. Um, and, uh, you know, when I saw that, I was like, this is totally awful. I, I would rather just see the, the original version, uh, and I preferred that anyway. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe my now, you know, super realized version of this is, uh, is, uh, is me ruining it. But um, I think it sounds better. So, um, so there's the kick drums. And, and so I added this. This is what I think was really kind of missing from the original version. Just every half bar. And this has got a much deeper low end. So like, I think the thing that I didn't really understand back then is like, you can't have really a lot of deep subby low end on a kick drum part that's going da 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 It's just, there's no time for those low, that low of frequencies to actually develop, you know, um, the next hit comes before you can really actually let that sound come out of the speakers and do its thing. And so, um, but it makes sense every half bar to have this big heavy, you know, anchor and have more of that sub information in there, but, um, you know, in a way that suits uh, what those sounds, you know, how those should really be applied. And so you get, you get this happening every half bar. And then the other thing I, I got going was um, I needed something that was even, you know, that was still like just kind of just punchy and raw in your face. And so, um, you know, we worked on this record and these songs for years. And there was many, many iterations and attempts to, you know, um, try and figure out how to make this sound that we were all envisioning happen. And so there was one round where I went to Fantasy Studios in Berkeley with Wally Buck and he set up a drum recording there and I played the, played the song live. And, um, 
And so there was remnants of that recording on one of the master tapes, and I was able to extract the kick drum mic and some room mics from that, and, um, and then edit it to match up with the programmed drums, um, which is something I, I wouldn't have been able to do, you know, um, back in that time. There was no Pro Tools. There was no way for me to, like, take a live performance unless I sampled it into a sampler and programmed it. Um, and we did do a lot of that, but it was, I mean, excruciatingly time-consuming. Every single note had to be sampled, assigned to a key, and then programmed instead of, like, putting it in Pro Tools with Beat Detective and having it just go you know, and fix everything in one shot. Um, so there was some stuff like that. But so, that, so I took this, this live drum performance of mine and um, used the room mic. And so it's kind of cool because you can actually hear, um, you know, the variation in the hits. That's, you know, two different, it was one kick drum with a double pedal. So there's two different beaters hitting on the drum. So you can hear there's a slightly different tonality to the two hits. It just sounds more like a human being playing the part because it is, you know. And so that blended in there um, sounds like, like this. That's without the live kick drum. And there it is with it. And you can hear this drum delay going on right now. That's, um, that was a trick that I used a lot on the T-Ride stuff. There was a couple different versions of it. Some of it was just straight delays, and some of it was pitched delays. Um, I've talked about that before. Um, so these are just straight delays. They're not being pitched down at all. Um, but it's basically an eighth note and a dotted eighth note. Um, so you get this, like, but, but, but kind of effect. And it just makes it sound like there's more going on. There's just more grace notes and ghost notes being played in there. Uh, it just adds more sort of activity to the drum part. Um, so the hits don't sound so lonely, um, even as, <laughs> as, as busy as this part is. Uh, it, it can always be busier, so here go the delays. Um, okay, so that's all the kick drum stuff. And I think there's um, some cool examples of getting the phasing right on things. So here's one of these things where I'm adjusting the phase in order to get this these downbeats to feel really solid with the drums. I'm actually turn up my headphones. This is kind of awesome because it won't bleed into the microphone. I can actually really hear this. Um, and so let me just make sure my computer isn't totally freaked out. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's still doing what it's supposed to. Okay, so check this out when I reverse the phase on this, this these downbeats. Really like hollow and no punch. There's all the punch, solid punch. And there it's all hollow and shitty again. And so what I'm doing here is, um, and these are tools that, oh man, they've just been life changing uh, for this record if I had stuff like this. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling it forward 500 samples globally. And then what I can do um, in case this particular sample needs to get pulled forward for it to actually phase better with the, the other kick drum hits. Uh, and I think that was partly because this sample was trimmed with a little bit of wind up at the beginning, so I needed to pull it forward. And so what I can end up doing is I have 500 global pulled forward I would start off with this slider at 500 and it not being phased reversed. And then while it's playing, I can start sliding it forward. So we were around here somewhere. And there it is. And sometimes it actually works better. It can be more revealing if you're adjusting for when it sounds the worst, which is what I did right there. So you can just slide it forward and you hear it canceling out and getting that really hollow sound where the, the real punchy part of the sound is just canceling out. And then you know once you flip the phase, you're gonna get all of that back. And so you can actually look for what sounds the worst 
and then flip the phase. It's a, it's a cool way to do it. Uh, but that's a really good example of how to, uh, what to listen for, you know, when you're trying to get the phase right. Um, okay, so then there are snare drums. So the snare drum samples, uh, so this, uh, this dry one, this was a sample that I made, except with the original version, there were two samples because I wanted to have like a right hand and a left hand hit. Um, it's the way I was thinking about it back then, even though like on a drum beat like this, you're, you would always be hitting with one hand, you know. Um, and the way the samples turned out, one of the hits was really good, and one of the hits was not so good. And you can hear on the original version of this song, there's one snare hit that sounds really solid, and one that sounds kind of weak and doesn't really punch through very well. And here, I'm gonna play the original. This is, this is actually the instrumental mix, uh, um, unmastered of, of the original version of this. I'll give a thumbs up for the one that I think sounds good, thumbs down for the one that sounds bad. It's pretty obvious to me, but it always drove me nuts. And I don't know why I didn't, I don't know, figure out a solution for it back then. I, I think the alternating of the hits was more important to me, so I just sort of suffered through one of the hits not being as good as the other. Um, and so, so yeah, check this out. Um, you get the idea. Uh, and so, uh, so I was able to uh, fix that <laughs> this time around. Um, and so I decided for this, I, I don't, I don't care if it alternates samples or not. You know, I just want it to sound great uh, every time it hits. So. That's what I did this time around. Um, and so we can start hearing um, these, these snare samples. So, okay, so th this is the dry part of the sound. There are some reverbs on up here. Let me just mute those for now so we can just. And so this was a sample that we made one time. We were uh, being kind of naughty. We were in this sort of office building and there was a, a storage like warehouse area in the back behind this and there was um we we were able to sneak in there we basically broke into this warehouse area which was like a, a much bigger open space and um brought a couple microphones and a snare drum in there so we could make some samples that had some really cool room ambience to them and uh and so that's what these samples are they were made you know probably 86 87 somewhere around there and um and so uh, I still had those samples around, and I, I made a battery patch of them. So here it is, T-Ride, Dry Snare 1 and 2. This is the one that I don't like the sound of, so I'm only using this one. And this one just doesn't translate as well the way it combines with the room sound. And you can even see the waveform. This one just has way more impact. Yeah, so there's that. And so then... We did it where we recorded this stuff, I think, onto a multi-track master, and then it got sampled from there. And so there is um, room sound microphone, or, you know, there was room mic set up at the same time. And so I would be able to pair the room sound with the same, with the corresponding dry mic, um, but it all had to be put together in a sampler. And so um, this all got recorded on uh, a multi-track master tape. I sampled the, the dry mics in, and then I sampled the stereo room in, so I'd have both of them and be able to blend them after the fact. Would have been way easier if we had Pro Tools. I could have just played through the song and you know been done with it. Okay, and so here is the room sound. And there's the good hit. There's the bad hit. <laughs> and so, so these guys, and on the, on the close mic, let's see, there's battery, there's some EQ just adding, you know, like low end punch, um, adding some brightness there, 5.6K, 6 dB, um, adding mid range, 4 dB of 1.5K. Uh, and then this, this is for the limiter. There's no EQing or anything going on, but this is a great limiter to just bring out an aggressive decay on things and also add a lot of aggressive attack. Um, and then I, ex I experimented with some different um, tape saturation things, and this one won. Uh, you know, 
I tried uh, like the J37 and Lo-Fi and a bunch of different sort of things and Saturn and uh, on this particular thing, this, this guy won, so there you go. Uh, and then this guy just adds extra mid-range to the attack of this. So you can hear this sample. Here, we'll just take everything off. And we'll just hear it dry. That's the original sound. And this poor, this poor computer is going to be struggling here. So now with the, the EQ adding some body. So there's that. And I'm also turning it down so I have headroom in order to do some of the other processing that I want to do. And so here's the extra 5.6K and the extra 1.5K. Okay, so there's that. And then here's the big compression explosion. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, you can kind of, on the tail of those, when the, um, uh, as the compression is bringing up the, the quiet part of the decay of that reverb tail on that microphone, um, and this mic was, was close up on the snare, but the room was so echoey that, you know, it picked up even in the close mic. You can hear um, the lack of bit resolution, because uh, this was, you know, a 16-bit sampler, and you hear it get kind of grainy and crunchy at the end of that, <laughs> that reverb tail. You don't really hear that that much anymore, but... Um, that's what low bit resolution sounds like. Yeah. Okay, so then there's this, which was the tape thing. Yeah, it thickens it up really nice. And then the extra mid-range attack. Yeah, a little more subtle there. Um, and so then here is with the room mics. Or that's, that's what they sound like by themselves. And then the two of them together. And it's a similar thing. So yeah, adding some body. This is right at you know, 390 hertz. Um, and then 5.6K and some more high-end airy stuff. And then a bunch of 1K and more high-end airy stuff. So this sample originally sounded like this. And it turned into this. And it just kind of focuses it, you know, the sound more in the range um, that it's going to be occupying, just that sort of uh, aggressive mid-range where the snare drum can cut through more. Uh, not, not sort of clouding up the lower stuff. Um, okay, so then the original thing definitely had a snare sample from When the Levee Breaks, so that sounds like this. And it blends in with the dry mic like this. And then with the, the room mic. I'm playing with the phasing on this. It looks like uh, I ended up delaying this uh, when the levee breaks snare a little bit um, so we can see what I did there. Yeah, just sounds, sounds fuller, you know, uh, phased this way. Um, and then this thing, um, w one of the things that I was kind of missing from the original version was you know, a lot of this we were really focused on getting this explosive room sound, and so I had all these samples that, you know, really feature that. But I, back then I didn't really know how to get um, just this really solid punch in drums that was focused with a lower energy. And so that's something that I added to this um, with a sample that I use a lot for, for that, since we're sampling drums, why, you know, why not? Um, and so here's a really great punchy sounding drum. Just dry, solid, punchy sound and snare drum that I could blend in with the rest of this stuff. And this is where you'll hear the sort of the biggest difference because um, I definitely did some playing around with this. So uh, I think I ended up, um, yeah, so I pulled it forward 200 
and then delayed it only 60. So that means that it, it's, it's moved forward 140 samples and then I reversed the phase. Um, so you can hear it happens first if I just flip the phase. All the punch goes away. And there it is. That just important, you know, instance of just pop right at the beginning of the sound. That's what really makes you feel what this part is instead of just this sort of like <laughs> sound. It actually has that pop at the front of it. Um, and so this one I also, uh, I ended up playing with the pitch of the sample. So uh, yeah, it's, it's this guy here. Yeah, so I tuned it up three half steps. The snare is uh, um, usually a lot uh, lower in pitch. And so it was a combination of playing with the pitch, the timing, and the phase to get it to really like land properly with the, uh, the other snare samples. Um, so let's hear that one more time. And then without it. So a another really good example um, of, of when I feel like, you know, you, you really get the phasing right and everything's adding up in a way that it all is pushing in the same direction and everything just impacts better, feels more solid and deeper and warmer and punchier and all those, all those good things, you know. Um, so then, uh, so that's the snare stuff. Um, for the drum fill in the beginning, um, there is my live kick drum, which is... And so, you know, it sounds like what you'd expect. Um, I ended up lopping off some of the really subby stuff and putting a little more aggressive attack on there so it would cut through better. And then there's overheads, so you can hear the overheads. And you can hear um, at the end of that me punching um, to get into a different take. You know, I probably tried that intro a bunch of times and got one that was um, as good as I could get it. And then after that, punched in to play the cymbals for the rest of the song. And so, uh, and then there's rack toms here. And these, uh, the processing that I was able to do now, I think, was way more effective on these. I was able to get it so you could hear the attacks a lot more clearly and the whole thing sounds a lot more aggressive. Yeah, so those are the tom mics. So I'm trying to like emphasize the fundamental tone of the, of the tom, add some aggressive mid-range and some brightness, and this is a dynamic EQ, so it'll only pushes up when the tom gets hit and it's not like drown, you know, droning away a bunch of extra low end. I uh, did the same thing for the floor tom here, just adjusted the frequency a little lower um, for the tuning of the drums. And then the thing that really made the difference is my good buddy, um, uh, Fab Filter Saturn. And so that's what really gets the attacks of the toms to just stay right up in your face. Um, so check this out with and without the, uh, the uh, Saturn on there. Yeah, so here's without Saturn. This is a big difference. With Saturn. You get all that cool aggressive mid-range and brightness on there in this like really cool crunchy way. It's it's a sound that I hear a lot um, on records from the 60s, mostly like late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, I guess early 70s. Um, the you know like the tom sound on the little drum solo that happens at the end of Black Dog. The the, the toms are so aggressive in the mid-range on those in such a pleasing way, you know, and without some saturation in there. If, you, if the signal's really clean, putting that much mid-range on there would just be bizarre sounding. So um, uh, Fab Filter Saturn, I think, is really incredible for that. And so then there's um, a, there were some room mics uh, I had going for this. It was not a particularly big room. Um, and so there's just a ton of compression on there to try and make the room feel more powerful and explosive than it was.
<laughs> yeah, you could you can really hear the the room sound cut off when I had to punch in for the uh, you know for the symbols. That's that's the way tape worked. You know, like you you have a an opportunity to hit record and <laughs> at the right time and then get into the next thing. And if you hit it a little too early, your room sound cuts off. And that's what happened there. So that's what we got. Um, so then uh, here, here it is all together one more time. Uh, and we'll turn, you know what, we can turn on the reverbs. The reverb is uh, this guy, the, the UAD version of uh, EMT 250. I love this reverb. I love the plug-in version. I love the original hardware version. I was definitely using this thing when I was mixing this album. Um, it was very common. Any, any you know, top-level studio mix room would, would have one of those in the room. Um, and so it's just a cool sound and reverb. It doesn't have any of these really unpleasant, metallic, clangy overtones in it. It's just a big, open, awesome reverb. And then this is just on the snare drum, just a mono kind of more focused little, you know, kind of dirtier, darker reverb on the snare. Um, and then this is that delay I, I mentioned earlier where it's an eighth note and then a, a dotted eighth note at the tempo of the song, which is 104. Um, and so here, let's, uh, let's hear all the drums with its verbs and everything here on this spectacular opening. Ooh, I just realized I should mute those delays on that last snare hit. They have no business being there. Let me just do that right now and actually do this right. Um, boom, boom. Yeah, it should be like that. We don't want to hear it. Bop, bop, bop on the last snare hit. Um, so then, check this out. The difference that um, FabFilter Saturn makes on these toms, it's, it's huge. So we'll hear it one more time with. Now without it. Yeah, I mean, on the, you know, the final album version, I could never get the toms to cut through like that, you know. I just, I, I just love this. So. <laughs> There's the last hit without the delays. <laughs> Finally got that right. All right. Um, okay, so there's the drum stuff in the beginning. Now we get into the actual drum groove. And there's a thing going on here. Um, I have it muted right now. Uh, and you can hear, let's see, we'll check out the cymbals. So it's just a close mic on the hi-hat and some overheads. It's going a little bit to that same delay. And I'm, I have these moments where I just pedal because that's I'm leaving space for where I'd play drum fills. And I mapped out all the drum fills on this. I had to because it was all being sort of overdubbed and pieced together and it all had to, to work together. And so you can see, I'm gonna go back here to some of these pictures. I found a bunch of the notes um, uh, from this song. And uh, so here is the original track sheet. Uh, sorry about the... <laughs> The somewhat explicit graphic on there that was uh, that seemed to be all over our documentation. I, for some reason, I guess uh, when I was in this band, a teenager, it was much like uh, Jonah Hill's character in Superbad. I, we just drew penises on everything, and there's lots of <laughs> explicit stuff all over all of our documentation. So it's hard to escape at this point. Um, but it's cool. You can see uh, the, the track sheet, and this pretty well held up. Um, you know, as I was doing these transfers, here's the hi-hat and the cymbals. And this was the only thing that was a little bit of a mystery, these dry toms. So um, you can see here that in the intro of the song, here they are, and it's on uh, channels 9 and 10. So that was coming from tracks 9 and 10 of the master, the 16-track master. After the beginning of the song, there were no more dry toms. Uh, through the rest of the of the entire master, and so I I don't know what happened with that. So here here it is, I'm definitely playing tom fills in here, and there's no dry tom mic. So that is a little bit of a mystery. What happened there? I don't know if I ended up ultimately sampling those toms or doing something else. So I've I've found some other stuff when some from the other takes where there were some toms being played, but it was room mics only and. And so I came up with a solution for it for, for this, you know, 
um, reconstruction of the song, but that I, I actually don't know what happened there. Um, and so you can see all of this stuff in here, and there's a lot of stuff that's sort of pancaked together. You know, there's like this hex guitar rhythm solo. We'll talk about that. There's um, the new super something. I don't know. Super, I don't know what that is. Um, left and right up here. Uh, there's a rhythm guitar solo. There's two tracks of lead vocals. And I, I, I would um, switch back and forth between those because they had different takes on them that we liked. Um, I also found the original work reel that had all of the lead vocal takes on it. And I ended up having to pull something from one of those because, yeah, it, I don't know. It was, it was interesting. Um, uh, and then here's the bass. Um, Oh, Super Chop. That was, uh, <laughs> that was sort of a slang reference to the guitar lick at the beginning of the song. That's what that is, Super Chop. Um, uh, the megaphone voices, a demo version of the rhythm solo, which ultimately got replayed here. Uh, but both of those are on here still. Um, there's some, um, some plate reverb that got printed for the lead vocals, this backward scream effect, general sound effects and stuff. Uh, lots of stacked background vocals, here's cymbals, there's the tom ambience, that was the room sound we just heard, more background vocal uh, down mixes there, stereo mixes of background vocals. Uh, but the thing I wanted to pull up here was, there's notes about the drum parts, so there was a point where we were experimenting with different kick drum patterns, like the one that seemed to work the best was the one that you know, you're hearing uh, on the song now, which is this do 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 ba do 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 ba do 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 ba thing. At one point, I was, I was just thinking of like, okay, what else could this pattern be? And so I, I wrote out these other patterns, and then I tried to play them or program them in um, to the uh, to the MIDI sequencer. And you know, none of them were any better. This thing is like do do ba do 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 something like that. Um, but you know, we ended up sticking with the other thing. Uh, we'll get into the whole drum part of this song because there's a whole legacy to that as well. It was originally an ex insanely complicated drum part. Um, the drum part that my drum teacher taught me that ultimately got me the, you know, the, the job as drummer in this band. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Um, so then there's another thing in here. Let's see, there's stuff about how I, I was EQing this stuff for rough mixes. So there's the, the dry snare. Um, there was a dry kick sound, which I don't, I can't find now. I don't know what that was. Um, the choo-choo sound, which is something I'm about to talk about. The bass and stuff like that. Um, and then there's a settings for the guitar sound. Okay, and so here are my notes on the drum fills. Um, and so in the intro section, right after um, the big super lick, there's the, the groove plays for a while, and then there's this da -da 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 bing thing that happens with this drum fill. And then this one, going into where the music stops before the vocals, the first verse comes in, this do 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 ba be thing, that's this fill. And then this is just dum do da dum be just these big uh, tom hits, just going boom, 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 kind of a thing. Um, and so I wrote all this stuff out, do do ba do 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 bing. This is going into the second chorus. Um, and so, you know, that's the way I always played it. Uh, this fill going into the, uh, going into the rhythm solo, that kind of a thing. Um, so yeah, I, found, I actually found me, you know, my notes, writing all of those out, you know, so I remember them and play them right, I guess. Um, so then, uh, yeah, so for the toms, you can hear here, I have these room mic versions of the toms that I ended up isolating. Oh, actually, they were bleeding into the kick and snare mic. And so it's still a mystery why they, they're they not on here. Because they're, yeah, they're not here and they're not here. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Um, but here in the room mics, this drum room stuff, there are toms here. So this is the first drum fill that had been written out. And so you can hear it in context. And so I pedal on the hi-hats because my hands would be occupied playing the toms. And so 
I wanted this to sound as realistic as possible. And also, we ended up shorting, shortening this intro. You can see here's the, the unmastered instrumental mix, and it's as long as all the stuff that's in the session. This is the actual final mastered mix of the song right here. And this intro section is way, way shorter because we cut it in half. And so that decision was made pretty early on, but the master tape had already been laid out with it this length. And so I, I would just, I just um, played this tom fill repeated times until I got to this break and played this one here. Yeah, and there's the little do -do 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 -bop -bing thing. Um, so then, uh, yeah, I think it makes sense to continue with the drums. So one of the things I wanted to show is how how I do this this drum sampling stuff now. And so um, back then, you know, I, I would put in put the CD of the Power Station song in my CD player, have the outputs go into the S1000 sampler, and play back the CD and sample some hits and try and trim them and you know line them all up and I'd have multiple hits because this song, the kick drum gets hit by itself a bunch of times. Um, but in Pro Tools, this is how I do it now. Um, and it makes everything line up way, way better. So I'm gonna reveal these tracks, pull these up. Because this is where I did this editing. And you can see what happened here. This might be useful to some folks. Um, so this is all in the beginning of the song. I uh, put it way at the beginning of the session. And so check this out. So I went through the song and here I'll just, uh, I'll make one of these active so we can hear it for a second and just everybody can sort of remember what this song is. Let me turn this down so it doesn't blow our ears up. Yeah, so um, that's that incredibly cool, explosive, super power, aggressive, amazing drum sound on this Power Station song called Some Like It Hot. Um, and so what I did is I went through and grabbed all of the kick hits that are isolated by themselves and lined them up on these tracks so I could make sure that the phasing of all of these would line up. So as I'm blending, because these are what, whatever it is, 10 different hits of that kick drum. And you can see that the, the waveforms are not identical. Um, the pitch and the way they develop is very, very similar. So you can see like the significant peaks lining up as this kick drum goes from the really aggressive bright attack where you get a bunch of really fast up and down stuff and then it starts to transition into the lower frequencies and then here's sort of the, the lowest frequency part of it where the, the waveforms get longer um, but you're seeing small up and down movement on top of it and that's the the high frequency overtones superimposed on top of this low fundamental frequency and so I'm making sure that that low fundamental frequency is lined up on all these samples. So when the, the sampler version of this is playing, I'm gonna disable these again. Okay, so here the, here's this, this guy and we'll watch this happen. Because it's just randomly cycling through these. I don't remember if I did um, round robin or random. We'll see in a second here. Okay, yeah, so that's random. And so it makes it so it's not just the same exact hit machine gunning over and over again. And you have those slight little variations of each hit have, you know, sounding like it's, a, it's its own thing. Um, but I made sure that the fundamental low end of all of those hits will always line up the same way in how it phases with other things. And that's something I would have been very difficult to do, you know, editing in a sampler because I couldn't see them all lined up vertically next to each other. It's so easy in Pro Tools. And so now I have 10 hits that are all unique hits that all line up, you know, with the phasing perfectly. So, 
Um, so that is how I did it on this round. It was cool. Um, I, I definitely works way better than uh, what, what I did before. Um, so I did the same thing with the, the levy breaks, kick drum, and this one has multiple samples. So it's the same thing there. All of them get lined up so they are phase accurate to each other, e even though the, the sort of bright details in them is unique to each hit. Okay, so now um, we can hear how all of this blends together. There is this extra element. If I pull up reference drums, so I used to make like a mono um, reference mix that would get printed on the master tapes um, to listen to. So I'm going to solo that really quick. Um, and so this, you know, when I throw on the master tape and we wanted to work on it or add an overdub or do whatever, I wouldn't have to do the whole computer sync thing to get all the samples playing back and go through that whole drama. Just there's a track on there that has a, just a mono drum mix. We can listen to that while we're working on the song. And so that is this mix. So we went from that uh, to something like this. Okay, and so there's a thing in there we got we got to talk about. It's called the choo choo, and um, it was. Uh, just a moment uh, in our endless efforts to try and get the rhythm section of this song to be its own cool, unique, whatever, groovy, amazing thing. And the, the drum part by itself felt a little bit uh, stiff by itself, I think. Um, just the nature of how those kick, double kick parts were played and stuff. And so we wanted to add percussion to it. But this was not a band where we're just going to like add a shaker, you know? And so Dan ended up taking a microphone, uh, I think it was just a 57, I plugged it into um, the, directly into the S1000 sampler and he made this choo-choo sound, literally like right into the microphone. And then I chopped it up into individual samples and put it on four keys on the keyboard. And then he performed in this choo-choo part. And you can hear it blended in with this mono drum mix. So that was that was Dan Choo Choo sound sampled, sequenced, you know, blended in. I don't have those samples anymore. They're on a S1000 disc somewhere. Who knows? Maybe it doesn't even. I don't. Know, I don't know where it is. Um, and so, uh, so I had to try and recreate that myself, <laughs> um, just to try and do this. So, uh, I took my little lapel mic, you know, um, a little while ago, uh, yesterday and went, you know, into it and uh, tried to recreate it. Admittedly, my choo-choo is not as cool as Dan's. Dan's was definitely, definitely better for sure. Um, but, uh, here it is. It gets the idea. Here's the new choo-choo. Um, and so... Uh, there's a bunch of samples here. Uh, I ended up removing one chew that was uh, not as cool as the others. And then it's a similar thing. It's just sort of randomly switching between all of these samples. And so, there you go. There's the choo-choo. <laughs> um, and so, you know, with everything else, let's make sure I got this right, uh, it sounded like this. So there it is without it. Yeah, I, th I think my choo-choo is a little loud um, in the in the blend compared to what I just heard on that other mic. Um, it was that, that's the the last thing I worked on effect. The last thing you worked on is always probably a little too loud in the mix. So, um, so there you go. There there's the overall drum thing. Um, and I think the, the only other thing I'm going to do is, uh, while we're on drums, and then we can, we can move on to the other stuff, is I'm going to talk about this drum beat a little bit. Um, I've alluded to it at times. 
But there's a spot in the song where this crazy vocal thing happens, and I'm gonna go up there so we can all experience this. It's this tag part here. And the vocals do this really crazy syncopated thing. Check it out. Okay. Let me, I'm gonna just, we're just gonna isolate those for a second just so we can experience the glory of that. Okay. Yeah, so here's just the lead vocals and the background vocals and you'll hear them doing this call and response thing. Okay, yeah, there's a somewhat not so awesome edit that I did coming out of that section. <laughs> um, I'll have to fix that. Um, and so what's happening there is, uh, I mean, the, the, the lyrics are somewhat self-explanatory if you can, if it's uh, intelligible, is uh, the gang is yelling out um, words that are words of destruction, just um, flat, torched, burned, whatever stuff. And then the lead vocal is um, listing off cities. And so these are the, all the cities that are being destroyed by the zombies. Um, and so that crazy syncopated pattern is the, the original drum beat for this song. And that's so much of what this band was about. Like, it, it was all like this crazy science experiment. And so there is this insane drum beat that originally inspired this song. Ultimately, we could never quite get it to work um, and have it be something that I think mortal humans could actually really <laughs> process and listen to in a meaningful way. But um, I think for, for whatever reason, we were still sort of attached to the part. And so the, the syncopated rhythm of it got translated into a vocal part and then put on top of this new simpler drum part, which is just do 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 bat do 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 bat right? And so the gang vocal is the snare drum part, and the lead vocal is the kick drum part. <laughs> so check this out one more time. And so what it would do is it would go It was this crazy drum part. So um, I don't have a drum set here. I don't even, you know, uh, it, it would have been fun to try and play it for everybody, but I, it would definitely take a second to you know, get my limbs to remember how to do that. Um, so I programmed it in so you can all hear what this drum part is because this is the drum part that they hired my drum teacher to play at one point who then taught it to me. And then when the band was looking for a drummer, they specifically said, we need somebody that can play this drum part. And it didn't even make it on the record. It got turned into a, you know, a vocal call and response thing. But so check this out. I'm gonna leave the vocals on for a second. And I have this, I programmed it in so you can just get an idea of what this part, what this part actually is, because it's insane. Uh, do, 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 go like this. And does this have anything to do? I don't think it does. Okay, so I think I'm doing this right. Go here, bam. And here, bam, here it is, okay. So we'll just, I'm just gonna loop this section here. Okay, so now we'll add this stuff with the vocals and you can, t you can hear how all of this lines up. I'll turn to the cymbals because there was, in the original drum part, there was um, cymbals playing along with it, sort of playing straighter as the kick and snare did this insane syncopated pattern. Um, so yeah, check this out. So there it is, like the vocals really do do exactly what this drum part is. Um, and so here that now now we'll just we'll just solo the drums for a second so we can hear what this is. Uh, yeah, so this should be just the drums 
with the overdub symbols, which are close to what the original thing was. And maybe I'll, let me, let me just turn off the delay, so that's, that's going to confuse things. So that was the part. And that was the, the straight version of it. And the part, the version of it that I originally learned, because they also experimented with it being swung. And so I put that in here too. Um, that sounds like this. So, so there it is. That it was just an insane part. You can hear how the whole pattern gets sort of displaced by an eighth note, sort of halfway through the thing. You know, it starts off with you know, and then they come on the on the upbeats. You know, halfway through, it sort of turns around. Um, so yeah, uh, an insane part. But that was. Part of what started this all so so there it is yeah I think that pretty well covers the drums um, you know the drums it's just this overdub cymbals this is all straightforward you know I probably just yeah I brightened them just a tiny bit they were plenty bright already took out some kind of clunky low end in them um, that was probably more for the intro uh, where the you know the overheads had the toms and stuff in them um, but yeah, so that that is the drum stuff. So moving on with with Choo Choo. Okay, so then bass guitar. Here we go. So um, we we liked really like percussive bass guitar stuff, um, but um, it was too. It had just been done too much to just. Um, to play slap bass, and there were definitely some abuses of that by the time um, we were <laughs> working on stuff, and it became not quite as cool to do that to us, at least, um, in the late 80s. And so our variation of it was to uh, not slap with your thumb, but hold a drumstick and, and slap, slap the bass with, with a drumstick, and it just had a kind of a harder, knockier sound to it that was, was kind of cool. And so it's all over this record. Um, a bass guitar being played with a drumstick um, in a sort of slap bass style. There's no pulling that happens. It's all just hitting with a drumstick. And so this bass part is, is that. And this is real simple. Like I just had, uh, we didn't have a really particularly great bass guitar. It was an Ibanez Roadstar 2. I'm going to show you what that looks like here because I have a picture of it. There it is. <laughs> this is the bass we used. Man, it looks exactly the same. I think, you know, I left the, the strings on it when I bought it. It had these same red cloth on the strings and everything. really looks exactly like it. Um, and so that, that's what this bass is being played with a drumstick. And here it is. And so, you know, it's kind of a cool pattern. It syncopates a little bit with the drums, and, uh, and you get some cool interplay between the, the, the bass and the drums. Yeah, maybe I'll try uh, soloing all of that up together here. Let me check out how that works. And uh, there's some kind of cool parts in the pre-chorus and the chorus when, you know, it sort of travels through more of the song. You can check that out. Yeah, 
know, so there's this cool little, uh, you know, and the chorus. Yeah, and uh, another somewhat ungraceful uh, edit going on there. Um, so a lot of times the way this stuff was tracked because we were recording on tape machines and um, uh, it could be very difficult to, to get the punches to work. Um, what I would do is I'd, I'd have two tracks available for capturing a part and I would play through as far as I could until I fucked up irrecoverably and then figure out where I could transition to the other track and I'd cut everything off very carefully there and then start a new track or I'd even decide in advance like I'm just going to play just the verses and once it gets to the pre-chorus I'll switch to another track and so I'd have places where I could have a seamless transition um, if I wasn't able to play the whole song through, which was not uncommon with these songs. The parts were really complicated and, you know, not particularly ergonomic to play. They were mostly conceived of in a theoretical way instead of just, like, sitting down with an instrument and trying to, like, you know, play something that's fun to play. We, you, you would have to force yourself to learn how to play it. Um, and so you can see here these edits, and this is me pulling off of the other track, um, that had stuff on it. And so it's, you know, it was switching between two tracks. I just went through and consolidated it on one track. So, um, you know, all those punches are in here. Let me actually put some, uh, crossfades on this right now. Uh, let me try and help that out a little bit. All right. Um, and so, uh, then there was this other thing where I think I, I had another pass of the bass playing the same part going through an amp with some, stereo widening stuff um, just to give the bass a little bit of a dimension so that was this and uh, and there's a little bit of an octaver on there and so that got blended in with this I, I don't know for sure I, I can't really hear it in the original mix um, but I liked having a little bit of it in there when I was putting this reference mix together So that's with it. That's without it. Cool. So, um, so that's the bass. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I, I, it took some effort to get it to be punchy. You can see there's a lot of plugins on here, and so. I did, I gated it a little bit because it was a little bit noisy just in between the hits and this thing is supposed to be really tight and punchy so there's a little bit of gating going on there. Um, okay, here's just, you know, pushing some nice fat low end, punchy low end, this 86 hertz, some aggressive, um, you know, high mids, 3K, uh, and then good old Saturn. Uh, so this is, nothing's going on here. And up here, there's definitely a lot of distortion in the highs to try and just uh, maintain the presence of the attack of the sound and just even that all out so it just stays in front of you. And then, okay, this is this new um, UBK uh, compressor. I, I, I like this thing a lot. Um, uh, I've, been, I've been using it quite a bit. It's, uh, it's got a pretty cool organic quality to it. Um, pretty, pretty satisfying. So uh, it, was, it was nice on this, punchy on this thing. And then I think I used a combination of two compressors. Yeah, so the, here's a, an SSL style uh, compressor. Um, uh, these are in series, both, you know, working hard to make the bass nice and punchy. Um, that, uh, the Allen Smart version of the SSL compressor is something that um, I've used on bass a lot. Um, there was a certain point where somebody told me, you know, this is a great bass compressor, and, uh, and, it, and it was and is, and so I used it a lot for that. Um, it's all over the first uh, Third Eye Blind record. All of that bass stuff was compressed, you know, in some way with that Allen Smart compressor. It's really cool for, uh, for bass guitar, especially for, like, finger bass and stuff like that. Um, okay, then here we go. This is... Um, taming down some of the um, real aggressive high, high mid-range stuff. Uh, and then 
This is a little more uh, bringing in some more low end after the compression. Um, and then let's see, what is this here? This is, uh, and then adding some mid range punch. So here, we'll take all of this stuff off. And you can hear the original sound by itself. Start adding this back in. Okay, and now with the EQ. You know, that's obviously with, with the Saturn. Uh, that, that makes a big difference. Um, and then here's with uh, the UBK AR1, I believe is the name of it. Yeah, AR1 compressor. Uh, I want to just cue up a little closer to this thing. And then here's with the SSL style compressor. Yeah, that adds a lot of nice punch there. And so then here's taming some of the brightness. And then extra low end. And then with the mids, the, the, the mid range punch in there. It's a little hard for me to get a clear sense of the low end with the uh, headphones on, but um, it was one of the things that I thought was really better about this new version is that the bass was a lot, a lot more discernible in sort of the, the big, um, you know, uh, onslaught of stuff here. If you listen to the original mix. Um, it's not as deep sounding, and I don't think it's quite as... Yeah, you just don't, you don't feel the movement in the low end as well in the original mix as you do with this new, new version. So. Um, so yeah, that was kind of cool to actually get that a little better. And so, uh, you know, that bass just basically plays through the whole song. There's a spot where it switches to a, uh, it just gets played with its fingers and, and does this. And this is where this gets bypassed. Yeah, you, you get the idea. Um, so there's the bass. There's some other bass elements uh, later in the song that are more kind of like effects. And so we'll, we'll check those out when we get there. But uh, let's get into the guitar here. So the guitar is a, the guitar is um, it's kind of an interesting story. You know, we, we wanted the guitar to be something really unique and extraordinary or whatever, impressive in some way or, or another. And um, we were not, I was not, you know, um, like I, I wasn't Eddie Van Halen, you know, like I wasn't just going to be able to sit down with the guitar and do that. And so we had to try and come up with our own way in order to make that happen. And there's a bunch of really interesting history to this. In Palo Alto, there was, um, uh, there was a guitar player hanging around Palo Alto while we were doing stuff that was truly extraordinary. He was this guy named Jim Finley. And uh, F-I-N-L-E-Y, his brother, Mike Finley, is still around. He's an amazing bass player and musician, um, still doing stuff. Um, but sadly, Jim, Jim has passed away. Um, and he, uh, you know, couldn't get things to connect for whatever reason to ha really um, showcase his abilities as a guitar player. If you're into, like, super flashy, crazy Buckethead, Eddie Van Halen, whatever insane 
you know, uh, Alan Holdsworth, whatever, any of those like super duper guitar um, guys, Jim Finley was every bit as amazing, if not more than any of them. He was totally unbelievable and innovative on the guitar. Really, really incredible. And one of the things that he did was um, he installed a cut switch on his guitar. I had never seen anybody else do that at that time. And he had these incredible effects that he did. There was some stuff that made it sound like he was playing backwards. There was things, you know, because like he would play dynamically into him cutting the switch off. And so it would have this like, it was insane to hear him do it. It was unbelievable. Um, and did a bunch of other really cool stuff that was like this really, you know, staccato, choppy kind of thing. And uh, it was very, very unique. He was super, super protective of his thing, you know, it was, it was, it was his thing. He came up with a bunch of amazing stuff. And um, I think it was sadly part of what uh, prevented him from really being celebrated for, for what he did. I think he was, he was so guarded about what he did. He, he really didn't trust anybody to ever, you know, put it on a record or release it or put it out there. And so he never really got recognized for how extraordinary he was. Um, but we were, we were all friends. We knew each other. My brother took guitar lessons from Jim Finley when he was really young, and um, we were all aware of him and his extraordinary gift for guitar. And when the T-Ride stuff started happening, it was, in Palo Alto, it was hard to not be influenced by him. He was a, a significant figure in the whole, like, rock music and guitar god thing, just regionally in this little area. And, uh, and so... Um, when we were trying to figure our stuff out, he, he was very like, don't steal my shit, you know, like, don't rip me off. And I think, you know, we genuinely were not trying to rip him off. And uh, I don't know that this has ever really been addressed clearly. Um, and there's all about three people on the planet that are going to care about this. But I, maybe there's some stuff uh, up on YouTube somewhere about Jim Finley. If you can find it, absolutely check it out. It's incredible. It's insane what that guy did on guitar. Um, and so we, we genuinely wanted to come up with our own thing, um, and we ultimately did do that. And I'm going to sh show how it happened on this song, how it got applied on this song, because it's, it's an unbelievable magic trick, the disparity between what's actually being played on the guitar and what you end up hearing come out of the speakers is a total magic trick. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, I think it's... It's unavoidable. Um, the reality is, is that I, I think this was influenced a bit by Jim Finley and his incredibly innovative stuff. Um, even though at the time, I think we were um, aggressively saying like, no, we're doing our thing and we're not ripping you off. You're ripping us off and whatever. You know, it's just like young, arrogant jerks being jerks, you know. Um, but there, was, there probably was an influence there and we took it in a direction that um, made made sense for us and it did kind of in its own way become its own thing that's throughout the uh, the whole t-ride record it ends up getting featured everywhere this um, which is essentially gating guitar um, using noise gates to um, cut the sound of the guitar on and off and make it this really like precise super choppy sounding thing it became sort of the signature sound for the band there was an experiment that was done with it early on on the song i hunger which was the first breakthrough where we realized like, oh my God, we've discovered our thing. This is going to be our guitar thing. And then it sort of evolved from there over the next year or two with us continuing to experiment with it. Zombies from Hell is an incredible example of what this is. And so what I have on the master tapes is the finished version of what the guitar ends up sounding like. And I'll, I'll play that for you. Um, so this is excluding the amazing guitar lick in the beginning, which I already sort of soloed up. Um, so here it is soloed. You can hear um, what the, the end result is. It's a combination of somebody playing guitar. In this case, it's me playing guitar uh, with a gate on it and some effects. But there's a very important delay that happens as well. And you can hear the end result. And uh, it's, it was played a few different, uh, there's a few different passes of it that got layered in here. I think on the final album, I only used the first example and the last example, but on this new 
uh, whatever, what I'm pulling up now, I'm using all three of these. Um, and so on the track sheet, this was like the old guitar. And I like this, it's a little fuller sounding, although the performance I don't think was quite as good. Okay, yeah, so that was one of the first versions of it for this song. And then there's another version here where um, I wanted the notes and the chords to come out clearer. So I played, I basically played that chord progression note by note. And so you wouldn't have all the inner, inner modulation distortion sort of um, muddying up the clarity of what the notes are in the chord. So then there's this version. And so then that, all of this stuff blended together to sound like this. Okay, and then in context, it's this. Okay, so how does one do that? This is how you do it. I'm going to demonstrate this guitar part. I have a guitar right here. I'm going to see if my poor little computer is going to be able to handle this. Uh, it's, it's working real hard to pull all of this off. So, so we'll make these tracks active now. And so here, I'm just going to turn all of this stuff off. Hopefully this guitar is remotely in tune still. Okay, there it is. And I'm gonna have to put this on a much shorter hardware buffer so I can actually play in time. So it's gonna do this, okay. It's kind of freaking out, oh! Okay, um, I was gonna try and um, actually show me playing this along with the song. There's no way my computer's gonna be able to handle that while it's screen capturing and doing audio and sh showing me my face, all this stuff. So um, I think what I can do is, just to, to demonstrate the first part of this, I, I think it's interesting to hear what the actual guitar part is that gets played as raw as possible. So you'll just hear it coming through my little microphone here, whatever my microphone picks up. And so you can get an idea what this, this gar what the guitar player actually plays in order to create this part. So here, let me get it so you can see the whole guitar there. And I was trying to get it to monitor through the computer, but like there was so much latency and it was just impossible to play. So, um, and the computer kept crashing. So here we go. So this is what I actually played on the guitar for this part, you know, when it went down without all the crazy like gating and delays and stuff. It's a really simple part, it's just That's it. That's the part. It's that simple. So let me go back here, even though I, I, uh, it looks like my computer is not going to be able to handle me actually playing this live, <coughs> recording the part live onto the thing. Um, I, I tested this earlier, and so we'll just listen to the test. So here is, and let me get this. So, oops, not that. Let me get the playback engine. So I got as much hardware buffer as possible. You're gonna be so happy, computer. You're gonna love this. It's gonna be great. Okay, so this was me playing this little SG onto the song um, when I tested this earlier. Okay, yeah, okay. Computer sucking as usual. So, okay, still playing back. So then, uh, you know, you can, I, I put a little EQ on there, a little mid boost. Um, and like uh, sort of Marshall-y type, modified Marshall type thing, which is the, the type of amp that was being used. And then here's the gate, but I'm gonna leave that off for now because I actually have um, the original notes for the settings for this guitar sound. So check this out. Okay, here it is. 
but yeah, zombies guitar tones. So it was the guitar, um, which in this case, the guitar that was used pretty much on this entire record um, was a, uh, a Charvel Model 1 that we, that we modified. So uh, it was just a cheap Charvel guitar we got for, I don't know, 200 bucks or something. And then um, we replaced the one pickup in it with uh, a, a real original Gibson PAF pickup. So it had a real deal pickup in it. And then uh, we added some other stuff to it as well. There was this, um, uh, Steve Womet was friends with this guy Bartolini that made uh, these amazing custom pickups. And, uh, and so Bartolini um, set us up with this, a, a hexaphonic pickup where each pole in the pickup was wound individually and went to its own separate output. And there was this multi-pin jack on the guitar. And so you could have each string go to a different amp. And so we had this whole crazy thing where we were trying to have each string get distorted separately so the chords would come out clearer. So there's a lot of very complex chord changes in these songs. So I don't have a picture of the actual, the, the one. It's kind of a cool guitar because it was like, it was the studio guitar and everybody that came in there to record that ended up using it was allowed to carve something into the body of the guitar. And so it has all of this in the body of the guitar, all these people that carved pictures and, you know, words and all kinds of profanities and whatever stuff into the guitar. But that was the guitar that was ended up being used uh, on pretty much all of the TRI record. And so it, it, was, it was this model guitar, a Charvel Model 1. And so, yeah, so we took out the original pickup, put in a PAF. It had this cheap, you know, trem bar in there. And then we added this Barnolini pickup um, to do hexaphonic stuff. Um, so that's the guitar that was used. This, this exact model looks exactly like it. Just had one knob and, uh, and a pickup. Um, and so, uh, so let's see, we'll go back here. And so now, oh, that's right. The, the, the guitar sound, that's what we're, that's what we're doing. So, the guitar was the Model 1, and then it was a little bit of a flanger on there. There's this ADA flanger that was set very subtle. You can just barely hear it in there, but it's kind of, you know, um, slowly uh, cycling through and creating a little more movement in the part. Um, and then uh, this uh, a GP8, uh, GP8, Roland GP8 guitar effects processor. And so this thing was essentially like a rack mount unit that was a collection of uh, eight boss pedals. So it had like a super overdrive pedal, a distortion pedal, um, an EQ and stuff like that. And so in, in there, the settings were like, I was boosting some mid range, you know, stuff like that. And then we had this little, uh, MXR micro amp, just a thing that just added level. So you could hit the amp harder. Uh, and then this was one of my Marshall amps, I believe new Marshall was one of my Marshall amps. So it was, uh, a 50 watt uh, JMP, I believe, a, a master volume JMP. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm not remembering that right, but it was a 50 watt Marshall um, head, you know, that would normally go with a 412 cab. And then it was a Steve Wometz cab um, with an SM57 on it. And then we had these Tube Tech mic preamps. So it was a Tube Tech mic preamp set at minus 20 dB, and then a Tube Tech copy of a uh, Pultec MEQ-5. Um, so there's a mid-range EQ there. So boosting mid-range, um, taking out a little bit of 2K. Um, that's, that's a move I would not do now. <laughs> um, and then this EAR, which was another copy of a Pultec EQ. And so this was, I don't know, boosting some, some real low-end stuff and some extra real high end -y stuff, 10K or something like that. Uh, and then compressed with a Summit Audio TLA-100. And then this um, a Lexicon PCM-70 digital effects processor. This is what did the actual delay part. Um, and so there was a patch I'd created called Zombie Delay. I just had to write and notate the input level. And then, uh, and then a Neve preamp. So this must have been at the studio that we built after we were signed to Hollywood Records because that's when I had access to Neve stuff. And so just raising the gain after the delay, output of the delay unit, uh, no EQ, and then to the tape machine. So that was the setup um, for recording this guitar originally. Um, and so now 
um, here, here our, de our demonstration will continue. So now I've turned on this EQ, which sort of emulates what was going on with the, um, the GP8 uh, processor, and then this modified Marshall kind of thing, similar to what I was doing. So here it is without the gating or the delay. So here's the part. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so <laughs> there it is, and played, you know, uh, not, not that awesome. Um, uh, I'd certainly practice it more when I was, as easy as it is, I still didn't play it that great. Um, okay, so now, this is with the gate, and what happens is, I'm going to turn on this track, and this track, if we listen to it for a second, let me see if I can get it so we can hear it, it's just a series of little beeping sounds. Um, I played an E, so it would at least be in key with the song, but it really hasn't, you don't ever hear this, it's just triggering the gate to open. So, that's what the gate is doing, and that goes to the key input, the external key input on the gate. So we'll turn this back on, I'm going to turn down the actual sound of that, because we don't want to hear it. We only want it to open the gate, and so now the guitar sounds like this. <laughs> Okay, now we add the delay and check out what happens. So there it is. There's that crazy guitar part. Insanely easy to play, and it's really just a lot of sort of you know, hocus pocus um, that that made it what it was. Uh, and so that thing, let me see if I can get this extremely unhappy computer to cooperate. We can hear that play with the rest of the band for a second. Uh, yeah, I think this will work, I hope. <laughs> You get the idea. You got to hear enough of it to know that's, that's the thing. Um, that's how it's done. And so uh, throughout the whole T-Ride record, there's just, you know, different iterations of that trick um, in order to get these really percussive, syncopated, complicated guitar parts, um, you know, that are, are not really, there's really no way to just do it with your hand. And it became sort of a signature part of the sound for the band. So there it is. Um, okay, I got to... Let's let's disable this stuff now and see if I can get my computer to cooperate and play things properly. Okay, so and so, you know, there's there's the final thing. Um, you can hear that soloed one more time. I put a little bit of extra reverb on there. Uh, that was the guitar trick. Let me, uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this crazy lick. I, I played Steve's version of it in the beginning, and we'll check that out one more time. So this is Steve Womet, um, who, uh, you know, played a bunch of really cool stuff in the studio uh, for us, and then ultimately when we went on tour, um, Jeff Tyson, uh, I think because of his vocals or something, I don't remember what all the the decision decisions were their uh, factor or the considerations were, but uh, J Jeff Tyson ended up being the touring guitarist. Um, but uh, man, did Steve play the shit out of this uh, intro thing. So here's Steve's version again. Okay. Yeah, so there's Steve's version. It's totally badass. Um, and then check this out. I, I have Jeff's version as well. And Jeff, also, you know, a, a wonderfully capable player, uh, played all kinds of uh, really cool acrobatic guitar stuff um, throughout the record. Uh, both Steve and Jeff uh, played stuff. I tended to play the kind of rhythm guitar stuff. That was what I was more interested in doing. Um, and uh, so I did a lot of that stuff, and they played all the, the acrobatics. Uh, so here's Jeff Tyson's version of the intro. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, so you know it's cool. They they both they both play it really well. 
Um, and Jeff had this thing where he had extremely um, strong fingers, and so he could, just by hammering on, the, the, the note volume was almost as loud as if he had picked the note, and so a lot of those notes that you're hearing are just him hammering, hammering notes across the, the fretboard. So. so there's guitar stuff. There's the rhythm solo, which is here. And I'm pretty sure I played this, this rhythm guitar solo thing. Um, it's possible that, I, I know I played one of the versions of this. As you saw on the track sheet, there were two different versions of the rhythm guitar solo. Um, I typically played stuff like this. I, I remember learning this part and playing it and recording it. Um, and I don't think it got replayed by anybody else, but it's possible. If I'm remembering that wrong, I, I apologize to either Steve or Jeff. But I'm pretty sure this is me playing, and uh, and it's this thing. All right, uh, I had to do a serious reconfiguring of our, my little setup here. Um, my poor little laptop was not not keeping up, so um, yeah, I just had to give up trying to have it do the be the camera as well. So it's going to screen capture, to playback Pro Tools. Uh, I have Logic capturing auto audio. Um, but now my face will be on here. It was supposed to save me editing time, but if it's glitching and stopping all the time, I have to edit that out. <laughs> it doesn't save me any time, so let's just do it this way. I think the computer is actually going to cooperate now. When we left off, we were checking out this uh, solo thing. Um, I talked a bit about... Um, pretty sure that I, I'm pretty sure that I played this, and this is a really good example of how the... Um, uh, how I would use multiple tracks because on tape machines, you know, the, the punching is destructive. And so this was a part that was just a little too tricky for me to just play all the way through. And so I'd play it in these, whatever this is, uh, two bar chunks. And so I'd play this section, make sure, to, you know, get a bunch of takes till I got this right. And then I'd play the next two bars, the next two bars, next two bars. And then, you know, I wouldn't have to worry about when I'm punching, trying to get this one right, punching and messing up the end of this one. So I'd always have this non-destructive transition between this take and this take. So here is the little rhythm guitar solo thing. And so this is like the same, a similar type of setup. You know, it was a Marshall with a Charvel uh, guitar with the PAF pickup and all that stuff. Um, and so this is that sound isolated. And it was mostly just me trying to sound like Eddie Van Halen, you know, uh, just trying to replicate his sound. Um, I just got some basic EQ going on here, mostly just pushing mids. Um, so there's a little extra mid range there and a high pass. Here's more 2.3K. And then this is just a little extra high end there. Um, and then this is another one of these things where I'm, you know, I'm trying to get all the notes and the chords to come out clearly. And so I believe this is, let me, let me hear it if this is. Yeah, so that's me playing this part one note of the chord at a time. So I broke the blo broke it up into three um, individual passes, and and so I'd play like the lowest note in the chord, and then the middle note, and then the highest note in the chord uh, to get all those to come across. It's, it sounds a little bit like Brian May because he you know did that stuff a lot, um, and so I I would just blend a little bit of that in with uh, these main guitars just to try and add some note clarity. You can hear that solo. So this is just the main guitars. And now this is with the single note version. There it is without it. There it is with it again. Yeah, 
so it's pretty subtle, but um, you know, definitely helps define the notes in all of these like major and minor thirds, and there's you know add notes in there. There's dominant sevens and all kinds of stuff kind of flying by, and uh, it helps clarify all that. So then, I think at this point, um, what is this? Let's see what this is. This is a. Uh, From hell. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's that's one of these uh, telephone dialogue-y things uh, that was in there, just part of the sound effects of the song. So here's it. And in the ensuing carnage, common man has put his father at the funeral pyre to these rock and roll abominations from hell. <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and so that happens in this uh, sound effects section here. I have some stuff muted. Let me see if I can actually uh, activate these tracks again without having my computer completely have an aneurysm. Okay, now we can hear some of these cool other effects and stuff. Okay, cool. So let's let's check some of this out. Uh, there's this whole like sound effects thing that was built up and then mixed to a stereo file, which is this here. And at the time, um, we were pretty into um, the band Skinny Puppy, and so we would, uh, you know, they had a bunch of amazing like horror movie sound effects and stuff in their songs. And so this was kind of, you know, our our version of that kind of thing. Yeah, so there it was. Um, you know, I, it, this is on the same tracks as a bunch of the background vocals, so right now it just has the same treatment as that. And so there's probably some... Oh, yeah, mm, that probably shouldn't be on there. Uh, yeah, let's see what it sounds like with that bypassed. Definitely don't need that on there. Yeah, you get a little more the the low end on some of those sound effects. It's a, it's a little cooler that way. I'm going to automate this right now to, to fix this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then there's this rad distorted bass sound. And, uh, this was definitely... It's definitely a bass going through a, a Marshall. Um, I'm trying to remember uh, any more details about it. Um, but this is a good example of how I, I'd EQ something differently now than back when I was, um, you know, mixing this album when I was 20 years old. Just a massive amount of low mids and, uh, and like, this is 672 hertz. Um, all the really growly stuff, and then here's a little more just aggressive high mids, 2.3. Because everything else um, is sort of voiced uh, to, to be this full spectrum of sound, and I need this to kind of punch through somewhere in the middle. And so all that stuff uh, helped it do that. Um, here it is in context. A uh, little bit of transient designer on there to just have the attacks um, punch through a little more. So without all that extra mid range, You know, it's it's kind of a deeper, more full range sound, but it doesn't cut through all the other stuff that's going on. Uh, obviously, there's you know a lot being boosted here, so the, the level is definitely louder with the EQ. But I, I think um, you know it just was not going to find its place, you know, with uh, without this extra mid range. <laughs> And 
and then there's this scream, backward scream effect. <laughs> um, you know, at the end there, just one last swell coming out of the section. Um, and then, uh, you know, let's see, I don't know if we're really ready to get into vocals and stuff yet. Um, what else is going on in this section? Yeah, I had to freeze a bunch of stuff to try and uh, free up some, some resources here. Okay, this was that, that dialogue that we heard. And I think in the final mix, let me just hear how this stuff is featured. Yeah, so that you know the the dialogue was really kind of buried in there anyways. That was I don't think it was ever really meant to be intelligible, but you all you all heard it now. Uh, okay. Yeah, and so then uh, yeah, we can check out these um, these gang vocals real quick. And this is a good example of a trick that I, I did a lot on uh, these big layered background vocals. Um, so I've got uh, I've got a send going here, bus five and six, which is going to this reverb, which is a reverse reverb. And I always loved it as a cool sort of very diffused slapback type effect. And so you can hear it on these. And so it kind of makes it feel like it's, you know, out in a big, you know, outdoor amphitheater or courtyard or something. You hear this big sort of diffused reflection coming back at you. So that, that reverse reverb is really cool on uh, big gangy vocals like that. Um, okay. So let's see. I got to kind of get my bearings. There's so many computer crashes and me starting and stopping so much. I don't really know <laughs> where I'm at anymore. Uh, Okay. There's another dialogue thing earlier on. Okay, yeah, so this is uh, more sort of like uh, a military panic alert announcement kind of thing. <laughs> uh, Dan was very, very into, uh, you know, military operations. There, there was one point where uh, one version of the studio was called Strategic Air Command after the, you know, uh, whatever it is, the, the allied European, you know, uh, air forces. Um, it's called the Strategic Air Command, I guess. I think I'm remembering that right. I don't know. Um, all right, so we've done a bunch of guitar stuff. I want to see if we're, oh, yeah, we're missing, there's, there's another guitar thing we got to check out here. So um, that is, it's, it's part of this guitar blend of stuff, but it came off of a work reel that got punched in as a stereo mix here. So we'll, we'll check it out, and then I have the isolated track. So, yeah, so here's like, so again, like, we were just trying to make stuff fit with limited tracks. I mean, there was no way um, this stuff would have fit on the 40 tracks that I had between the two uh, tape machines. There's a 24 track and a 16 track master. And so a lot of times things just got, um, you know, sandwiched together on the same track. So here's more, uh, another layer of gang vocals that layered with, with these, if it's not exactly the same. Yeah, I think it's just an additional layer of voices to make it a bigger group. And then that turns into this volume swell guitar thing that happens in the breakdown.
Yeah, and then it transitions back into the, the part with all the gating and the delays and stuff like that. Um, and so I found the original source for all of this stuff, and I think it's down here somewhere. Yeah, here it is down here. Again, we'll see if the computer's going to cooperate. But um, so this is the individual tracks that made up that volume swell guitar. And so there's a bunch of stuff that is, I believe, individual notes. And then towards the bottom here, there's ones where I'm actually playing the full chords and doing the swells. And it sounds like in the final mix, it's mostly these ones where I'm playing the full chords and these single note ones were probably, you know, submixed a lot, just blended in a tiny bit, you know. Okay, and then the other thing that I found that was kind of interesting was uh, just another idea that was tried for this section um, that we ended up not using. Let's see, I th I'm guessing maybe I'll pan it like this. But there was like this real strummy guitar, like funky guitar version of this. And then we, we tried it in a couple different octaves. Um, but yeah, this is pretty hilarious. Uh, here, I'll turn this off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think we made the right choice. <laughs> the swell guitars are considerably better. Let's hear the low octave. That's probably that's a little closer, but still, the, the swell guitars are just more what this band was about. It's, it, 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 it should never sound like just a person playing a guitar, you know, it always had to be something really unique. And so that's what we ended up with. And then there's a bunch of these, these pick scrape effects. And so that's just, you know, uh, you doing a pick scrape with the gate, chopping it on and off and then a delay on there to make it sound like more is going on than there really is. Um, okay, so then anybody comes back in. Okay, so there's the end of the song. So I think we've covered all, the, all of the instrumentation stuff. Um, we did the distorted bass, we did all this and you know in reality like this was trying to be in a certain sense uh, really relatively simple where um, it's just drums bass guitar and you know a bunch of vocals like, like harmony vocals and so that is basically what's in here there's some sound effects in there um, in that one breakdown you know section but um, or that uh, yeah the big gang vocal section but other than that, it is just a, a drum part that's the, you know, uh, the sort of <clears throat> combination of samples and live performance and all a bunch of stuff went into creating a drum part. And then there is a bass part. Um, there's sections where um, there's like a distorted version that comes in, you know, like that brown, brown, that, that gets played on the main bass as well. We just needed it to be more distorted sounding. And so, you know, overdubbed that other sound. Let's see where is the where's the bass here there it is yeah and so you know the the regular bass played you know played those same parts and so this is basically the same bass part here it's just adding a bunch of distortion to it, you know. 
Okay, so so it really is just drums, bass, this you know complicated guitar effect with all the the gating and delays and stuff, and um, it just it had to be done in individual bits because it really wasn't stuff that you could just set up in a room and play. It just wasn't designed to do that. Um, so let's get into the vocals here. So there is uh, a main lead vocal track, and this uh, on the original master tape was broken up onto a couple different tracks. I, I consolidated them here um, so that it'd be easy to keep track of. And so, um, you know, Dan had uh, an interesting approach to, to, to the vocals. Like, he... Um, uh, was, I mean, had an extraordinary, you know, ability to transform his voice. Uh, you know, like he could sing crazy high. There's there's a note, I think the highest note that he hits is in the song, Fired Up. It's insanely high. Um, and so he was able to do that and also sing really, really low in songs. So there's a song, uh, Back to Romeo, where he sings. So there's super crazy range that he could do. Um, but it was not easy. And so, it, again, it wasn't something that he could just kind of like step up to a microphone and do all of this unbelievably acrobatic stuff. And so the way the vocals were done, the, uh, most particularly the lead vocals, was that um, he would only sing th this type of lead vocal stuff if he was totally by himself. Like, not even go to the next room. You had to leave the building. Like, you couldn't even be in the building while he was recording these vocals. And so I would just set him up um, with the microphone that we were digging at the time. We used an 87 at times. We tried the 47 tube. We had a 47 FET. Um, There's a few different mics that we tried with him on different stuff. Um, and I would have to, I'd have to leave the building, just get levels so they're conservative, you know, in the ballpark and just cover a wide range of volumes that come out of him and, uh, and just let him track and ha give him a bunch of tracks available on the tape machine. He knew how to disarm and arm different tracks on the tape machine. He would just start recording himself, um, you know, and go through it. And then I would come back and comp things. Um, but I couldn't be in the room while he was recording. It was just... Him, a microphone, the tape machine, and at least a six-pack of beer <laughs> was, was part of the thing. And, uh, and so this is what, you know, what we ended up with was this super high, crazy, acrobatic stuff. And so, you know, there's like, uh, I'm sending to some reverbs and stuff here. There's, uh, there's a couple of reverbs here. So I have, oh, this, um, this vocal widening thing. This is a trick that I used to do on the Eventai H3000. So this is a recreation of that. It's delayed 13 milliseconds here, 23 milliseconds there. Um, down 10 cents here, up 10 cents here. It just makes it sound like there's a subtle sort of stereo doubling going on on the vocal. And then uh, more of this EMT reverb. Love this thing on vocals. And then what is this? This is a delay that gets sent to the EMT to sort of make it sound uh, more, you know, just to, to last longer in a more diffused way. Um, and so that was basically it, you know. Um, there was no tuning. I mean, I, there was, I had one trick that I could control the pitch offset of an H3000 with a pitch controller and very rarely but occasionally if we were really stuck we would use that trick to try and fix the pitch on something if it was something that we really wanted to keep and uh, was just almost impossible to sing um, uh, but you know for the most part this is just him just wailing right into a right into a microphone and uh, as far as EQ is concerned I just lopped off the low end um, and then added some mid-range. This thing was just a little too scooped out sounding to, to cut through the track. So a little extra mid-range in there. And then I had printed, you may have seen it on the, uh, the track sheet, um, we had an EMT 140 uh, plate reverb, a real one. And so 
I did a reverb delay combo and printed it on the master tape because we, we were pretty fond of the way that um, plate reverb sounded. So this is that part of it. And then there's, um, there's a spot where he sings really low in this breakdown. And so I put that on a different track because it definitely needed a totally different treatment. I'm pretty sure, you know, on the final mix that it, this, this part of the performance had its own channel on the, on the console. And I did a completely different treatment because it required a lot more, um, you know, compression. And I believe I used that um, Dolby uh, signal to noise stretcher effect, the Dolby A trick on this. So I, I don't really have anything quite like that here, and this is, you know, just trying to get things in the ballpark. So um, just a little bit of EQ on this. Uh, yeah, this would kind of do it a little bit, just compressing the high end would, would uh, get us a little closer to that, uh, that Dolby effect. Um, so there's that, and then the rest of it uh, is just plays out as is. Okay, so this takes us into the background vocals, and the background vocals were a huge whole thing uh, on on these records. So, um, let me see why I'm here. Okay, yeah. So, um, the uh, there was we we sort of settled on a formula for the background vocals. These are all three part harmonies, um, and typically what would happen I think I've talked about this in another episode is there would be a melody that Dan had wrote um, that he was singing over a section of the song, and then there were the chords that were playing, and we would go back and figure out what the other two parts are based on what notes were available in the chord that weren't being sung, sung by the lead melody. And so that's how all of this stuff got, you know, sort of figured out. And, uh, and so here, this is the first pre-chorus. Here's the, uh, the big background vocal part. And so here it is by itself. And the way we stack those, the, the formula that we came up with, it would take 18 tracks um, times two, because uh, there were two people that were singing. Um, so Dan would do 18 tracks, so six passes on each of the three notes. That's 18 tracks. And then there's another singer, this guy named Dave Candelaria, um, who had a great sort of rock and roll voice, um, that would then also do 18 tracks, six notes on each track. So, what is it? That's uh, 36, 36 tracks in order to get this effect. I think this is only half of that. This cruise control thing didn't have the full 36 track um, treatment on it. And this is a combination. I can hear both um, Dave and Dan's voices in this blend right here. Cruise control. You know, and they would just get panned out to sort of spread out into a big stereo wash of voices. And then so here, this is the chorus part. This is the Dan 18 tracks, I believe. Rock and roll, zombies from hell. Rock and uh, That sounds like both of them as well. I, I, that sounds like both of them in there. Yeah, so this one, early on, we may have tried to get away with just doing 18 tracks, a combination of both Dave and Dan. And then later, Dave came back and sang another round of 18 tracks, which is this here. Rock and roll, zombies from hell. Uh, that's both of them as well. Okay, so uh, on this particular song, it didn't get split up that way. This was... This was one of the very first songs that we did for the record, uh, and it had it, we worked on it f literally for years. And so, um, I think some of these was kind of before we had really figured out the formula. But then you layer it all together. Rock and roll, zombies from hell. Rock and destruction. 
and you got yourself, you know, 36 tracks of sc screaming rock and roll vocals. Uh, and then there's this, this had to be done as a separate pass because it sort of overlapped. This is them saying just rockin' at the end. And then here we are into that, uh, that crazy drum beat thing. Um, so that's how the background vocals were done. Um, there's a bunch of cool examples of it. Uh, it's a lot of sort of the same things repeating here. <laughs> yeah, so that uh, that's definitely both of them. That's both Dan and Dave in there. Um, and I did find some places where um, I have all of the individual tracks of some of the stacks, you know, because what would happen is we'd have the main master tapes where the final stereo blends of these vocals would get printed. Um, and we had work reels where all the tracks were open and I would just have a couple tracks, you know, music for reference, some guide notes, and then you'd have 18 tracks open where you'd layer up all these vocals. And uh, so I found some of that stuff. You can check out what is going on here when you're stacking up a lot of stuff. And let's see, does this have the guide? No, it does. Okay, yeah, so we'll, we'll turn all of this on. Rock and roll! Zombies from hell! Yeah, so uh, there, there it is. But yeah, th this is a combination of both of them, actually. So uh, a lot of this was ended up being sort of intermixed. I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Uh, it's pretty crazy loud. Okay. Rock and roll, zombies from hell. So let's see what we got here. So this is... Rock and roll, zombies from hell. So that's Dan. Rock and roll. That's Dan again. Dan. Rock and roll! Zombies from hell. And there's Dave. Yeah, so it was three and three. Rock and roll! Zombies from hell! Yeah, so there's Dave, and uh, and then here's here's Dan. Rock and roll! And you can kind of hear um, they would do these test notes to try and get their throat placed properly to do <laughs> to sing these parts. So you can hear them uh, you know, testing the note before the part actually kicks in. Rock and roll, zombies from hell. Um, and so then these are the little guide notes, uh, so they know what melody to sing. So. On the guide note, if the note wasn't changing, even though there's additional syllables, if the note doesn't change, the, the guide would just sustain through. And, uh, and so this is what it would sound like. With the guide. And that's, that's what they ended up singing. And it's interesting because like, all of this stuff has never really been in one place before. Uh, there was just no way, there was no device um, in the late 80s that would allow me to have all of the individually performed background vocal tracks and all of these, you know, guitars that were layered together, everything all in one place. I'm still working on transferring all this stuff. It's all over the place on these master tapes, and I think I'm going to find more of these layered background vocals and at some point I'm going to get it so everything is in one place like and all lined up and together you know because we could just never there was no way to do that um, with the technology that was available at the time so that's finally going to happen and uh, it's pretty striking actually how how much clearer and more present you know these vocals sound uh, not having been bounced That's a pretty, a, a pretty great sound compared to what it ended up being, which, let's see if this is, this is that same thing. Uh, maybe it's, is it this one? Rock and roll, zombies from hell. 
you know, it's just a little more mask sounding and it's kind of cool hearing it really revealed like that. Um, uh, pretty, pretty amazing. So, you know, I don't know if there's ever any reason to do it, but it would be cool to really hear this stuff totally fully realized, you know, um, and just like what, what I always hoped it would sound like and really actually have the tools to be able to do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think we did it. I, I think we actually touched on everything in there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that was, that was interesting. It, you know, it's definitely probably one of the least known of, of uh, the stuff that I've, I've put on here. Um, but, you know, it wasn't due to a lack of effort <laughs> to try and do something extraordinary. And, uh, you know, we really, um, at the time, you know, we, we were really chasing something that we, we thought was, was going to be very, was really revolutionary, you know, and there, and there really is a lot of very innovative, you know, creative stuff going on in, in, uh, in these tracks. Um, it was really, really fun for me to dig back through this, try and pull it all together into a session. Um, getting this whole thing to work was a little tricky. Boy, my laptop did not want to do it, but you know, we ended up in a place that's working, um, and, uh, and revisit this and really try and revisit, like, you know, how, what my brain was hearing, you know, on this stuff, whatever it was, um, you know, 30 years ago, and try and actually see if I can, you know, execute it. Um, I wasn't really able to totally go to the end, but there, I can tell just from the beginning of this, um, working on this in my laptop and trying to pull stuff together, that it was um, already felt way more like what I always hoped it would have sounded like. Um, and it's interesting to sort of um, be in that, in that position. So it was really, really fun for me to dig this up. Uh, maybe there'll be opportunity to do more. Um, maybe, who knows, maybe I can get Dan to come in here and uh, give his input on this. That would, that would certainly be fun as well. So so there you go. It was fun for me. I hope that was fun for you, and I will see you next time. Bye. You put the who's in on the what's in. Attach the what's in to the who's in. Connect the thingamajig to the thingamabob. And that'll make the whatchamacallit go. You hook the gidget to the gadget, adjust the gadget, to the gidget, unhook the dingly dang from the diddly doo.